podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody. This is Chris Pettit, the director of the Office of Agricultural Water Policy at uh, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consum uh, Agriculture and Consumer Services, if my tongue would work this morning. It's nine o'clock. I know uh, folks are still joining us, but uh, we wanted to be uh, effective and efficient this morning. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get rolling and kick it off. This is our uh, annual stakeholder meeting and, and update. Um, we are glad that everybody wanted to, to hop on and talk about the, uh, the great things that the office has done over the past year. Uh, we are, as you can see, still virtual. Uh, we are uh, greatly looking forward to, to seeing everybody in 3D and uh, probably expanding things a little bit, doing a little bit more of a complex program next year. Um, this year, we really just wanted to, again, run through each of our departments and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, sections within the, the, the office. Uh, and talk about what they were focusing on. Um, folks have heard me talk way too much over the years, so uh, I'm going to kind of kick things off and, and chat a little bit about a couple things that we're doing in administration. Um, however, uh, this is really uh, to let my just amazing staff sign, and, and I'm proud to have some of the, the best folks in the state working for me. So um, they're doing wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, as, as they say in the business, uh, any errors are attributable to me. Um, anything great, uh, they, they're the ones that, that boost this office. So uh, we're really proud about everything that we've been able to accomplish. I need to remind everybody, um, this meeting is being recorded uh, for, for our purposes, training purposes and other purposes to use the uh, catchphrase. Uh, we are uh, gonna make uh, the recording uh, available to, to folks that are, that are interested, give, should an interesting question come up. There are going to be a couple of opportunities to ask questions and, and we really encourage it if there's something out there that you're interested in that we're working on or uh, that is uh, um, coming up or that you've heard about or whatnot, we're, we're happy to take the questions. Um, and if it's something that needs to, to have a little bit more detail and need to put on the bones, we'll be glad to, to let you know, take it offline and, and make sure that we get to, to the right person and, and have that in-depth discussion. Um, the staff that are, are going to be presenting today, again, are, are just some of the best and the brightest in the state. Um, just to, to introduce folks, um, my, my deputies are on. Uh, Clegg Hooks, many of you know, uh, is, is one of the deputies. Uh, the other deputy is, is new. Uh, Lisa Mustaine has, has joined us. She uh, came in and, and uh, came into the spot that Kim Sugar had previously occupied. Uh, she had a, a, a distinguished career at the Division of Administrative Hearings. Um, she is continuing the great work uh, that we're doing to uh, continue to tighten things up and, and make sure the clocks are set right, uh, the trains run on time, uh, that we are as efficient, as effective as we can be in human resources, in contracting, in finance, um, in any number of different uh, operational uh, pieces. And then she, she also helped out uh, more and more on the the policy side as well. Um, and I, I wanted to introduce her. I'm going to kick it over to her for just a, uh, a minute in a minute to say hello. Um, we do have Bonnie Wolf Elias from uh, field staff. Uh, Angela Weeks Somini was going to join us, but she had a last minute uh, issue that she had to take care of. Uh, Angela Shillette from Policy and Planning will be presenting. Uh, Catherine Holland. Uh, who handles uh, all of the great BMP research and uh, interactions with our academic partners um, also has our rulemaking and um, uh, binding determinations uh, is going to be on. Uh, she has taken over for uh, Bill Bartnick and we, we couldn't be happier. Uh, Kyle Ferris, who is the data manager who has the unenviable task of, of putting up with me as uh, a you know a steampunk Willy Wonka uh, demanding that my chocolate factory be built. Um, what we have done and the advances that we've had on data management is one of the areas that we are most proud of. And uh, the ability to, to be transparent, the ability to be very accurate and, and really tied in uh, on our data, you're gonna hear a lot about it. It's just a fantastic advancement. So we feel as though we, we continue to, to really move the ball forward. Um, oh, Jacinia, I'm sorry, from, uh, from uh, the, the policy and planning uh, Escobano from uh, Policy and Planning is also on, and she will be uh, helping us out with uh, a couple of the panels. Um, 
Jess Stempion from Policy and Planning is uh, the one that is helping to facilitate uh, this uh, lovely webinar. So uh, anything that, uh, as it moves smoothly and, and we stay on task, she's the one that uh, is the, the task master making sure that we're where we need to be. So um, with that, I just wanted to kick it over to uh, Lisa, uh, if, if she is on. Um, uh, to say hello, and then we've got some uh, some some webinar participation instructions for you. So, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you first, and then we'll we'll go through the instructions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, hi to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm very excited about joining the OAWP team, and look forward to meeting you in person when the opportunity presents itself. I'm currently immersing myself in all things ag water policy. Um, lucky for me, it's my good fortune that, uh, like Chris was alluding to, we have many incredible people here that are both knowledgeable and dedicated. They're showing me the ropes. So um, my current focus is on improving in internal administrative processes, hopefully to provide our staff the tools they need to do their job both efficiently and effectively for all stakeholders. So if I can be of service to you, please don't have, hesitate to, to reach out to me. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Jess, did you want to go through the instructions and then we'll get right on into the agenda and, and kick on through? I'm actually yeah, going to turn right. it over to yep. Angela. Yep, I was going to say good morning. This is Angela Chalette. Uh, I'm going to run through the, the housekeeping really quickly. Um, I know we're all really familiar with uh, these remote meetings now, but go to webinar is a little different. So uh, just to talk about a couple of things there. Everybody has been muted at this beginning just to keep down the background noise. Uh, there are some handouts you can download in the GoToWebinar handout space and refer to during the meeting, including the agenda and some instructions since these uh, controls are a little less familiar to everybody. Um, you can open and close your control panel with the red arrow. Um, if you are having any trouble hearing the speakers, you can try to restart, please, and, and see if that works better. If it still is an improved call in using your phone and the call in number that's provided in the registration. Um, once we start our Q&A sessions, we're going to have two during the meeting. Uh, the raise hand feature will be enabled and we will unmute everyone and then call on folks uh, sort of in order as we go along. So um, if you want your control panel to stay open all the time because it will automatically close when not in use, you can go into the view and uncheck the auto hide and then you'll be able to see the control panel, the question section and everything. Um, right now we're asking that you reserve the question section just for technical questions since we are going to have the live Q&A portions um, and staff will try to assist with those questions as we go along. So uh, that was everything for the housekeeping, Chris. Uh, back to you for the administrative section. Thank you. Um, so we've been, I just wanted to kick off by talking a little bit about what we've done at the uh, the administrative level uh, and, and some of the changes that we continue to, to make. Um, we have uh, been, been repositioning some folks, you know, with the, the continued implementation of Senate Bill 712. Um, we've been continuing to take a look at our resource needs. Uh, we do have, um, as folks will have seen, a, a legislative budget request in uh, for additional positions as we see what the workload looks like and, and uh, the data management needs and, and whatnot. Um, so it, it has been a, a continued effort. Um, this is the first time that uh, we, we've implemented some of these, these data management and data collection uh, pieces. Uh, so uh, with a bill that I think was signed June 30th went into effect uh, July 1st, we, we have had to, to kind of build the plane as we're flying it a little bit. but. Uh, Again, uh, my staff has just done just done a, a fantastic job, but it has required some some really keen and and uh, targeted uh, adaptive management as as we have learned lessons along the way. Uh, so so we have had uh, a couple of those pieces come out. Um, it has also resulted in uh, continued um, updates as we tighten down some of our contracts with our conservation district partners, and we have. Um, updated and really kind of honed in on how to get the best out of our 
uh, contracts with those partners as it relates to um, the BMP technicians that assist us in the implementation of the program, as well as uh, the, the way in which we implement the cost share program and, and how uh, through the IV process, we better identify uh, how to best target uh, specific projects, specific practices, and, and how to tie into those areas of, of natural resource concern uh, to make sure that we're getting all the, the conservation benefits that, that we intend and, and making sure that our contracts and um, application process and everything that we collaborate with the conservation districts on uh, is, is extremely important. The other thing I will mention uh, is that we have taken our mobile irrigation labs, which are just this, this lovely, highly effective way of getting folks out and, and looking at efficiencies in, in irrigation. Um, we have tied that more closely to the implementation verification process, particularly since in many, many areas, uh, irrigation is just so closely tied to nutrient management and, and ensuring that we're not um, having um, you know waste essentially um, nutrients that are that are put down that that are valuable uh, that cost money uh, fertilizer prices are through the roof uh, making sure that we're not irrigating in a fashion that that um, you know makes it less efficient in terms of nutrient uptake because of the the, the moisture and the way in which the the, the water moves through the soil column um, that's been a, a, a really interesting process, and, and we think that we've got a, uh, just a very, very effective uh, outcome on that front. Um, alternatively, uh, or I'm sorry, additionally, we continue to look at budget. Um, we are uh, very aware that we are spending state taxpayer resources. We want to be fiscally conservative. We want to make sure that we are accounting for every dollar that we spend. Uh, Gina Eubanks from my office has just been fantastic, um, and we want to be responsible to uh, the taxpayers of state. We want to take to be responsible to to our producer partners. We want to be responsible to our our stakeholders that depend on us um, to to be successful in meeting the requirements that we have under the statute. So, uh, our budget has been something that we have. Um, we continue to regularly meet, regularly re-examine, and regularly figure out how we can be more efficient uh, in the way that we utilize state taxpayer dollars. So um, we continue on the administrative level to, to find ways to improve, um, continue to, to welcome any comments as to, to where we think we can become more efficient, and uh, just want to thank everybody who in my office who uh, assists in, in getting there. Um, with that, uh, I will turn to either Lisa or Clegg if they have uh, uh, anything to add there. Um, and once we get done there, we're going to pass the baton uh, to Bonnie uh, for the, the field operations update. But to start, uh, Lisa and or Clegg, if you wanted to pop on, if you had anything that you wanted to, uh, to highlight, um, I would uh, appreciate the input. Lisa, did you want to, uh, to pop in? I was going to give Clegg the opportunity to pop in, but, um, you know, just to, Chris, you said it well, just to add that we're really um, looking at our, our internal processes and um, we're really trying to, uh, because we're growing rapidly, um, become efficient and effective in, in how we uh, process work. And we look forward to um, becoming putting one foot in front of the other and put, become more efficient in the future. We have big plans. There's been a lot of um, internal staff that has provided information and um, Angela weeks um, Gina, we um, really uh, have taken a really good look at that. So uh, I appreciate that. Clegg, are you Thank on? You. Clegg is not, but um, actually I was, was going to ask Jess if you don't mind going back to the agenda. There was one thing I wanted to highlight real quick. Uh, a big part of the the operations of this office, um, and you, you see them on this agenda, uh, is the uh, the administrative relationships that we have with our uh, state and federal agency partners, and that that's something else that we have made a concerted effort through the office. Um, to, to continue to enhance. And we've married our uh, policy reps in the, the various water management districts to their environmental manager partners in the, in the field staff. 
uh, tried to tie them in not only to our water management district partners, but also to the local governments uh, and, and various political entities within those regions. Um, we have uh, engaged further on the federal grant sphere, um, engaging with USDA through NRCS, uh, and, and Juan's going to be on, and, and Nina from his staff has just been uh, invaluable. Um, and uh, the, you know, the folks from EPA, uh, we have made sure that we continue to keep up with. Um, we engage uh, with the Army Corps of Engineers on uh, many issues, including down in South Florida. Uh, that, that cooperative federalism, those agency relationships have just been invaluable. And I, I do believe that, uh, again, uh, putting aside some of the noise uh, that I, I know comes out, um, you know, be it media, be it, uh, you know, various uh, public events, uh, very, you know, politics, whatever. Um, I can reassure you, at least from my vantage point, I think that we have really wonderful, successful uh, relationships and, and we really treasure the folks that we get to work with uh, from these various agencies. So you're going to get to hear from them. I just wanted to give them a, a, a shout out and, and note that from the, the executive administration level, it's something that, given my background, we, we put a lot of emphasis on because it really does take everybody coming together to, to make sure that we're making the progress that's expected to us uh, of us by the, the, uh, the taxpayers and constituents of the state. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Bonnie, uh, allow her to, to kind of walk through the, the field operations update. Um, again, we, we are gonna try and move through this pretty, uh, pretty quickly and, and, and efficiently. Um, happy to answer any questions. Um, but just want to be able to, to highlight the great things that this office is, is continuing to do. So, uh, Bonnie, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And good morning, everyone. Since we last met, we have made some changes to the field staff management structure. We promoted two staff to environmental managers in the Northwest and in the St. John's River Water Management District areas. This now more closely aligns with the Water Policy and Planning Unit's Water Management District assignments. Each environmental manager supervises both full-time state employees and conservation technicians. The total group is comprised of 52 positions and it is proven to be inadequate to meet our new statutory, statutory obligations. The Office of Ag Water Policy's request for additional positions is critical for us to continue to deliver the BMP program appropriately. Next slide, please. The enrollment numbers reflected on this slide are based on the updated FSED data, the updated FSED data set using ag acres as opposed to actual parcel acreage. Eagle-eyed observers will notice that the enrollments are a bit stagnant at just over the 13,000 mark. There are two different contributing factors here. We are consolidating NOIs, notices of intent, in areas where producers may have multiple fields under the same operation, and the nutrient records are tied together. In order to facilitate the records collection, we have aggregated their notices of intent. The other factor is the lack of staff to achieve both the goals set forth in Senate Bill 712 and enrollments. Most of the additional enrollments occurring in the past year are associated with the IV implementation verification process and making updates in property ownership. Next slide, please. There are multiple cost share partners within each water management district area. So this is being represented together. The spend down has been rapid in North Florida during first quarter. So we're currently evaluating how to allocate resources to capture their needs for the balance of the fiscal year. Fixed capital outlay funds, which can be spent over a 36 month period, have been appropriated in the Northern Everglades for several years with the purpose being to fund large projects. We have a need for those types of funds in the rest of the state to give us the flexibility to fund large projects when they're identified. We have requested this statewide fixed capital outlay funding for the last five years, but have not yet, it, not yet had it appropriated to the Office of Agora Policy. 
Next slide, please. The Northern Everglades enrollment effort that was required by the Lake Okeechobee, Caloosahatchee, and St. Lucie B maps was a massive undertaking. From the data evaluation, the mailing of letters, responding to angry landowners, to, tracking, to a tracking effort that caused us to create a separate dashboard system. There are almost 2,000 parcels waiting to be enrolled just in the Northern Everglades. The existing staff cannot achieve the Senate Bill 712 implementation verification requirements and get these parcels enrolled expediently. Most of the eligible ag acreage was already enrolled and implementing BMPs. We continue to work with the Department of Environmental Protection to categorize the various types of properties to determine the appropriate action. And Angela Shillette will be talking further about that effort in her presentation. Next slide, please. The Office of Ag Water Policy is on task to make certain that we achieve full implementation verification evaluation in the priority basins as identified in Senate Bill 712. We have tied the mobile irrigation program into the implementation verification effort to make sure that the evaluation of irrigation systems continue to be prioritized. These efforts are taking all of our resources, including getting assistance from our administrative staff. This is truly an all hands on deck situation. We are hopeful that we will be awarded the additional positions that we have identified that it will take for the Office of Ag Water Policy to not only effectively implement the implementation verification process, but to bring the BMP program to full enrollment and full implementation. And that's my presentation. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, this is Angela Shillette. And uh, as I said, this is going to be uh, my policy update uh, for the meeting today. Um, next slide, please, Jess. Uh, as you know, FDAX coordinates an access cooperator with many state and federal agencies, as well as local governments and other entities on policies, rulemaking procedures, uh, or other activities, code enforcement things, uh, anything of that nature that might affect agriculture. Um, uh, one of our largest areas of cooperation and coordination is with DEP on the BMAPs and TMDLs, but also with the water management districts for water supply planning and the FSET agricultural demand projections, water use needs, um, the number of different regional coordination pieces that in some place blend these items, uh, such as the Northern Everglades and Estuaries, uh, CFWI, the Central Florida Water Initiative, and also the North Florida Regional Water Supply Planning Area. Um, and besides that, then in South Florida, beyond NEEP, we are working on with the uh, South Florida Environmental Restoration, Central and Southern Florida projects, uh, the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, and right now uh, a large part of our time is being taken up by the Lake Okeechobee System Operating Manual, uh, LOSUM update. Next slide, please. Um, as I said, one of our coordination priorities and a, another Interdistrict uh, DEP uh, effort is on some of the uh, interdistrict MFLs, minimum flows and levels that are coming up right now. Uh, we're going to hear from the Water Management District later. I believe uh, he was going to talk about the Santa Fe and Suwannee. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the coordination priorities also include, as I said earlier, the, the NEEP area and NEEP interagency coordination. Uh, right now, the interagency agreement is being uh, revamped because the current uh, agreement will expire next March. Uh, we have also started with South Florida Water Management District and DEP, a technical team looking at some targeted restoration areas. So uh, that's that's been a very uh, interesting close and look at some of these uh, smaller basins where we're looking for uh, what sort of above and beyond maybe projects or other uh, efforts could be made to improve water quality. Next slide, please. Um, one of our largest discussions right now, and Bonnie touched on this earlier, uh, is with uh, 
DEP on some of the land use classification pieces and what is what is agriculture. Um, the first item on the list, urban ag, uh, in the last session, as most of you know, the legislature authorized a pilot project uh, for looking at uh, urban agricultural opportunities. And the department, University of Florida and NRCS are cooperating to uh, develop the program. And this is, uh, again, another agency where the department's continuing to engage with local governments on these uh, policy level issues. The next three bullets uh, refer to lands that fall into uh, agricultural land use when you look at a, a statewide scale. Um, but present difficulties for enrollment. Um, uh, enrollment of all ag lands is required within the Basin Management Action Plan areas, as you know. Uh, and then the BMAPs identify those uh, areas that need to be enrolled using that statewide coverage. But we find when we start to do mail outs and try to get out and do enrollment, we are uh, tied to and dependent on the parcel level data and the parcel level data often gives us a slightly different answer. Um, so that's that's one place where we are uh, talking to DEP about narrowing down or uh, winnowing out some of the things that, that fall outside the agriculture realm whenever we're looking at the parcel level data. But we still run into uh, rural residential areas, which are uh, areas where it's primarily a residence, but they may have horses or cattle or some sort of an ancillary, you know, garden, but are not primarily agriculture, uh, not primarily what the BMP program was, was uh, structured to uh, take care of. We're also finding the diversified operations uh, fall into that, that same category where uh, a lot of them tend to be smaller, even though they're not necessarily. And uh, we're looking for, you know, do we adopt another manual to handle diversified operations? Do we try to fit them into current? Um, and right now uh, we're holding on to them, their agricultural lands, and we're just looking at how to best deal with both the rural residential and the diversified operations as far as handling to help meet the BMAP water quality goals. Um, Fallowlands is another uh, category where, you know, we can't enroll uh, a parcel where there isn't current ag activity uh, unless they meet some very specific criteria for uh, the inactive enrollments. So uh, fallow lands can be some large swaths that are awaiting development or other things. And uh, like I said, we're coordinating with DEP on how to handle that. Next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a couple of more examples of, uh, like, like I said, lands that are probably in transition that the top left there, it's shown as single family, uh, but it's not yet got a house on it. It doesn't have any indication that there's agriculture and yet it still uh, kind of counts against us, if you will, uh, on are we meeting 100% enrollment within a BMAP? So that's what when Bonnie was saying, we've enrolled most of the eligible acres or the applicable acres. This is kind of what we're left with. Um, and to being dependent on parcel data, you can see sometimes there are just gaps where we have lands that are deemed agriculture, but we don't have uh, data from the Department of Revenue or the counties that tell us who we would contact to enroll that parcel. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, get ready for the data management piece. Kyle, I believe, uh, is going to be on for us here and talk to us about the technical upgrades. Hi, Erin. Thanks, Angela. Uh, I wanted to point out real quick with our annual report, uh, it's our current annual report and the last two annual reports are available on our website. Uh, you can Google FDAX and OOP to find the website or you can memorize this long URL right here. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out by this red arrow is uh, we have a brand new story map. And this is basically where we take our downloadable report and we put it into an interactive environment. This is the first time we've done this. Uh, next slide. So if you click on that link, uh, you'll be now you'll go to this story map here. And like I said, it's an interactive environment um, of our downloadable report. The first tab you see in the top left, our executive summary matches the same executive summary that's uh, in our report. You can zoom, you can uh, scroll down and read the executive summary if you'd like. Uh, next tab, please. 
The second tab there uh, is uh, our statewide metrics. You can see our statewide enrollment on a map. Uh, you can scroll down, you can even add our, there's a map there, you can search an address or a city and it'll zoom you to that location and you can find out whether or not your that address or that location is within a BMAP or two. Um, the third tab, the BMAP, BMAP metrics tab is, is really neat. It takes our BMAP one pager from our report and puts it in an interactive uh, environment. So you can go BMAP by BMAP, zoom around, and get a general idea of where we have enrollment in the BMAP and where uh, we're identify identifying agriculture in the BMAP. I uh, highly re recommend you guys check it out. It's a really neat um, tool that we've put out there for the public. Next slide, please. Quick FSET update. FSET 8 has been released out in July. Uh, we are currently working on FSET 9. Uh, at this point, we've collected all of the water management district's water use permits, and we are reviewing the data uh, right now. And of course, the main purpose of this data set is to project water use estimates all the way out to 2045. Uh, next slide, please. This is our, web, our FSED website. You can also Google uh, the words FSED and OOP to find that website. Uh, on there, you can find our FSED 8 report along with the geospatial, geospatial data uh, available to download. Uh, we also have last year's report, FSED 7, available. Um, there's a link on that website as well that takes you to an interactive dashboard in case you don't have any GIS capability. Uh, in that dashboard, you're, you're able to play with uh, the data that's within the FSED data set. Uh, next slide, please. Real quick, I wanted to touch on the amount of workload that's gone into our uh, NARF program. Uh, this was a massive undertaking in response to Senate Bill 712. Since we, were, since we were not given much lead time to get a system in place, we had to build from scratch and adjust in real time while implementing the program. It took about over 60 hours of coding just to, uh, for our system to be able to handle the amount of data coming in. Uh, as of last month, we had over 5,000 NARC forms submitted. That has resulted in over 38,000 lines of data. And because of that, the amount of data that's coming in, we've actually increased our QAQC efforts by doing a monthly check of the pre previous month's data in addition to reviewing a percentage of all incoming data throughout the year. This is an intensive undertaking and it's to ensure accurate data when we're reporting on BMAPs. Next slide, please. Some continued efforts uh, with the data management group is one we're trying to uh, streamline the IV process for field staff and producers. And on the right hand side, you can see a screenshot of our VAC checklist where we've taken it and created it and recreated it in a digital format. This way, field staff can take can either fill it out in the office, they can take it out in the field and fill it out, uh, save it, and then send it into our system, and our system just absorbs the data magically. Um, the next thing we're, we're continuing our efforts on is improving the way we visualize our NOIs. Currently, it, we create a coverage on a monthly basis. Uh, hopefully, early next year, we'll be changing that uh, process so that the, the data layer is live instead of having to be created every month. Uh, that's that's an exciting task for us. And lastly, we are in the middle of testing our offline mapping capabilities. There's a handful of field staff out there that are um, downloading small portions of maps onto their devices and taking them out in the field where there may not be good cell, cell phone coverage or internet coverage, uh, so they can actually do, uh, you know, work offline. Uh, next slide. That's it for the presentation. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Um, and yes, uh, Kyle mentioned the NARF. That is our nutrient application record form. Um, so uh, for anybody that wasn't aware, and also I should have mentioned earlier, we will be posting uh, the slide deck for folks either emailing it or putting it online and sending a link. So you'll be able to access that so you don't have to try to uh, write down or, or note any of the, the links or anything that Kyle had included there. We will get them out to you. Uh, next up, Ms. Catherine Holland he has recently taken over the, the research and BMP development group, as Chris mentioned earlier, uh, and she is going to both talk to us a little bit about the 
outreach and uh, education and then got, go right into item three on the agenda uh, with Dr. Dukes. So go ahead, Catherine. Good morning, thanks, Angela. <clears throat> so far this morning, you've heard about some of the changes in the office over the past year or two and staff have been creating outreach materials to help explain the reason for these changes and what the changes mean to producers. Kyle mentioned the legislative report story map, which is a great way to browse the annual report by BMAP area. Other updates to the OAWP website include revisions to the frequently asked questions page and the compilation of a frequently asked questions document that can be downloaded from the website. Staff have also been working with the FDAC's marketing department and video production team to produce several short informational videos about the FDAC's BMP program. Four videos are complete and one more is currently in production about what is a NARF. And as it's been mentioned, if you don't know what NARF stands for, it is the Nutrient Application Record Form. The NARF video will include information about what it is and how to complete it. Um, upcoming video topics also include why are nutrient and irrigation management important? What are mobile irrigation labs? Why are they important? We're planning a video about cost share for BMPs, and we're also planning a video about uh, what type of research OAWP supports and why. Next slide, please. And speaking of BMP research, OAWP continues to build on its research program with the objective of funding projects that support and provide the scientific and technical justification for the FDAC's BMP program, or to investigate new innovative practices or management systems for efficient nutrient and irrigation application. So for pro projects um, such as fertilizer rate studies, OAWP has added a water quality monitoring component to the study sampling plans to help understand the impacts of BMPs on yield as well as water resources. So for example, depending on the study site, we might either sample leachate right below the root zone or sample surface water runoff, in addition to taking soil and plant tissue samples. And we can use results from these studies to also inform crop models to help understand or um, to predict treatment impacts to yield and to water resources. Findings from research are, are used to recommend new BMPs or to support the existing BMPs. Next slide. Recent statutory changes now require OAWP to develop an annual research plan and legislative budget request for BMP and nutrient reduction projects in cooperation with the University of Florida and other state universities that have agricultural research programs. To help meet this mandate, OAWP has formalized the research project proposal submission process and timeline so that proposals are now accepted during a specific time frame each year. Uh, potential projects are then discussed with a research coordinating work group, which is comprised of representatives from the agricultural industry, um, water management districts, FDEP, the NRCS, environmental organizations, and universities. Approved projects are then included in the annual research plan and legislative budget request. So the upcoming proposed schedule for research projects is to post the RFP in early January of 2022. Proposals will be due in early May. We'll meet with the research coordinating work group in mid-June. Final decisions for projects that will start July 1st, 2023 will be mid-June so that we can submit uh, the LBR on time. For the fiscal year beginning 
that begins next July 1st, 2022, OAWP submitted a legislative budget request for research totaling just over $3.3 million. And if approved, this funding will support both new and ongoing um, research projects. So OAWP has been coordinating more closely with the University of Florida on research, on outreach, and on other projects. And Dr. Michael Dukes, who is the director for the Center for Land Use Efficiency with the University of Florida, is going to talk um, a little bit about that next. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I wish I could see you all, but uh, I will look forward to that next year. So uh, a little detail on the IFAS OAWP Working Group. This group was created in June of 2020 um, in collaboration with uh, Chris uh, Pettit uh, from OAWP and the Deans of Research and Extension at UF IFAS. And uh, in my mind, the, the purpose of this group is really to maintain communication with OAWP and uh, uh, work on topics that um, are potential hot topics before they become too hot. So in any case, uh, we were immediately tasked with working on communication regarding SB 712. And that's a lot of what this group has talked about over the past year or so. And that led to, um, the FAQ document, which we worked with OAWP on uh, gathering those questions and gathering responses to those questions, which we then placed on our blog site. And uh, OAWP also has a very similar document on their, um, on their website, as you saw earlier. Um, there were also a number of other blog articles that we put out on letters to producers uh, that was requested by one of our agricultural agents early in the days of 712 coming out, there was just a lot of confusion and a lot of questions from growers. And so uh, those efforts ended up being multiple blog posts about uh, the, the uh, 712, what it means, what it doesn't mean, record keeping. And then uh, I, I think it's fair to say there was kind of a road show of uh, meetings, Zoom meetings or anyway, virtual meetings around the state and then some face-to-face -face later on where Chris talked at many of them and uh, Catherine, we had Catherine on to clarify some issues with our uh, faculty about grant procedures and things like that. So it's really just communication, really communication, getting the right information out and uh, continuing on that. So as far as the AI project update, what that refers to is the project that was funded in the last legislative session. It was an LBR put in by IFAS to work on phosphorus on tomato and potato with an AI or artificial intelligence component. And the status of that project is that um, it, was, it was funded and that's funded uh, through FDAX, through AES. The tomato trials are uh, ongoing in Southwest Florida. The potato field trials are planned and will, will actually start in January when potatoes are planted in the TCAA. And then the, as far as the AI or artificial intelligence portion of the project, the team is working with the, uh, an existing team in uh, College of Engineering who's got a lot of experience in AI on assimilating existing nitrogen and phosphorus field trial uh, databases. So they're they're working with that. And they've they've just started getting those in. Um, there's a lot of talk about AI, and uh, at the university, it's a major priority. But one of the elements of AI that's really a big job is getting the data in a format that can be useful, and then uh, associate quality controls on those data sets. So that's what the team's working on right now. That's all I have. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Dukes, and thank you, Catherine. Uh, we are now going to start the first question and answer session. Uh, the raise hands feature is going to be enabled, and um, we are going to unmute everybody. So if you will use the microphone on your control panel to mute yourselves until you're called on, that'll help us keep background noise down. Thank you. And this is Chris while we're we're waiting for hands to be raised uh, and then questions. 
Um, I know we we just went through um, you know a number of different really cool things that that we've been continuing to do within the office. Um, you know, I, and you know one that came to mind is the the, the story map. Um, we've been making really good time. Um, please, you know, if there were anything that you, it was anything that you saw in those those presentations that you have additional questions on. Um, again, we've we've got a minute or two to to uh, build in. Um, if we wanted to to take a look at something that you you saw that was interesting, um, or um, revisit something in one of the presentations, just let us know, and uh, we look forward to talking about it. So. As I tap dance, waiting for hands to be raised, uh, I'm not seeing them. So I guess, uh, Jess, if you wanted to help me out here, if anybody has questions. And yeah, it, yeah, Angela, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, so far we do not have any hands raised. It does not appear, Chris. Excellent. Well, I will. Uh, I will count that down or mark that down as uh, the staff doing just an amazing job. Um, and uh, thank you for, for kind of being so clear and, and uh, letting everybody know what's going on. Um, I did want to thank Dr. Dukes. Uh, he has been uh, just a, an amazing resource from the University of Florida. Uh, he's been extremely gracious with me. Uh, been wonderful working with Catherine. Um, the, the University of Florida has been a just a fantastic partner uh, a, working with Extension to to, to do frequently asked questions as it relates to the, the, the results and, and how 712 was being implemented. Um, I've had the privilege of doing a number of different webinars and, and uh, answering some questions uh, as it relates to how we're getting out in the field and, and what research needs are out there uh, and, and what we can do to, to be more efficient and effective in the way that we implement our programs. Um, I see Dr. Engel uh, on the call and, and uh, we welcome him as the, the, the new VP over at, uh, at, at IFAS. Um, I know Scott has, has had a whirlwind since he's come in and um, he's just, just a, an amazing person to deal with. He's a, a brilliant man with a lot of experience throughout the country um, and has just been a, an absolute asset. So the ability to work with the, you know, the professionals at the University of Florida to, to make sure that we're getting our research needs met um, to, to, to identify where we have things that, that we can stand to work on moving forward um, and the way that we integrate uh, the research program uh, and the, the great things that the University of Florida does on the research side into what um, I think we all acknowledge has been uh, since 2016 and now uh, kind of even further into 2020, um, you know, a more regulatory program and, and that that governance interaction is, is not always the easiest at times, um, but we continue to, to find ways to, to lock elbows and, and move forward. And uh, again, Catherine Holland is doing just a, a phenomenal job in, in continuing to, to, to do that good work. And, and it's always great to, to be able to pop in and, and hear the wonderful things that she's doing with uh, uh, Dr. Dukes uh, with, the, with the coordinating group. So, Chris. Um, yes, no. We do have one question from Ms. Uh, Noreen Bearden. Um, Noreen, you've been unmuted if you want to unmute on your end and ask your question. Yes, I was wondering if there's any update on when the IFAS fertilizer rates will be updated. We have uh, continued to work with, uh, with IFAS. Um, I and, and I'm, I'm going to kick it to Catherine in a minute. What I will say is, is that there are actually joint efforts ongoing. Uh, the University of Florida, through the great leadership of Dr. Engel, um, got ahead of this issue and, and got in um, during last legislative session um, and identified um, a, a couple of projects um, that, that they uh, were aggressive and went and did some um, just some fantastic work and, and are putting together some research. And, and again, Catherine is um, part of the team assisting with implementing that research. Within the OAWP budget, uh, we also have identified several rate projects that we kicked off as of July 1st of this fiscal year. Uh, and part of the research plan, um, one of the things that we needed to note was we are in uh, for just under $4 million uh, to the legislature based on the requirements of Senate Bill 712, the 712 that we put together a research plan for budget submittal. Um, there's a significant part of that research plan that is also tied to 
uh, updating rate research um, to ensure that we're, we're getting rates that allow us to balance production um, with water resource protection, with water quality improvement is the language of the statute, um, you know, on the, uh, on the holistic level. So with that, uh, Catherine, I know you have more detail. So if you don't mind kind of talking about the, the projects that we have identified that were already in implementation, um, and also those that we have included as part of the legislative budget request, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Um, let's see, we have currently a nitrogen rate recommendation study for corn, another study going on for rate recommendations for cotton. <clears throat> we um, are proposing studies for phosphorus fertilization on blueberries. I think there's some nitrogen fertilization studies for blueberries ongoing with the University of Florida. And we're also, uh, looking to fund some computer modeling projects to help us to help us understand the rates um, a little a little better as well but i think you covered pretty well i don't know if dr dukes has any um, anything else that he might want to add about the rate studies yeah just to mention um the existing studies on a control release fertilizer on corn in north florida control release fertilizer on watermelon so I would anticipate those two projects, and uh, uh, Catherine, I'm hazy on whether there are other CRF projects ongoing, but I would anticipate those projects um, leading to new rate recommendations eventually. Yes, you're correct. We've got carrot, corn, and watermelon controlled relief, uh, controlled relief, controlled release fertilizer studies going on. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, uh, thanks for those answers and thank you for the questions, Brandon, Ms. Bearden. Uh, and now, uh, Bob, I saw Bob Hockmuth had his hand up if you want to ask your question, Bob. Yeah, just not necessarily a question, just to follow up um, to the uh, information that Michael and Catherine have provided that uh, an update on the carrot work. Uh, this goes back several years with funding from, uh, from FDAC's Office of Ag Order Policy to develop the our uh, to review the current uh, recommended rate for carrots, and we've concluded that work. We have a journal article now that's accepted, and the next step would be to uh, present that information to the Plant Nutrient Oversight Committee at IFAS. So, um, so that's another one that is very close to being considered to be updated. Thanks, Bob. And uh, since Bob joined in, uh, good morning, sir. Um, the, the folks at the North, uh, the North Florida facility, again, and we're, we're running some really cool projects through there. Um, you know, again, Bob's been a, a real conduit um, there and has done a, just a great job uh, working with us in, the, in, in that North Florida Springs region um, to identify some, some really good things and, and help us facilitate some, uh, some, great, uh, some great projects. Um, Bob did mention that the PNOC, another just wonderful effort that, that's ongoing. Um, you know, we have to base our, our regulatory program on the best available science and, and technical. Um, so Dr. Dukes, um, Bob, uh, others at, at the university um, have really been helpful in terms of making sure that we have identified uh, those peer reviewed uh, EDIS, PNOC, you know, uh, approved documents that allow us uh, to be able to, to lean on that scientific and technical expertise uh, that, that the research is able to provide to, to help us be effective as we, um, again, implement our uh, best management practices program and dial in uh, the, the applicable BMPs, the applicable nutrient management practices, um, the, the applicable projects and practices that are necessary to mitigate um, you know, potential leaching uh, off of a, a production landscape. Um, you know, this this has been an effort that, again, we've we've tightened down. Uh, I think a little bit from where we've been in the past, but it's really allowed us um, to eliminate some of the the confusion, identify some issues that need to be addressed and questions that need to be answered, um, and get ourselves in the the right foundational stance moving forward. Uh, to be able to, uh, you know, continue to defend the great things that we're doing through the program. So thank you, Bob, and, and uh, again, thank you to, uh, to everybody that's been involved in, in that effort. Any other questions, Angel? 
Uh, no, we do not have any other questions right now. So, uh, Chris, if you're okay, we'll move on. Yes, ma'am. I'm talking too much. Today, so. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Uh, yep. You'll see the raise hands has gone away again, and Jacinia is going to mute everyone. Muted. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. Muted. Unmuted. Okay, so now uh, Jacinia Escribano, who is our OOP uh, liaison, uh, our BMAP coordinator for all the state uh, on the DAC side, uh, is going to introduce our person who's giving the DEP update, Ms. Julie Espy. So uh, go ahead, Jacinia. Thank you, Angela. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you this morning. Up next, we're going to hear from Julie Espy, who is a director of DEP's Division of Environmental Assessment and Restoration. Julie, the floor is yours and you are unmuted. All right. Thank you, Jacinia. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning. Thanks for the opportunity to um, give a brief update to you guys on kind of what we have been doing at DEP. Um, you know, uh, there's already been some mention of Senate Bill 712 or the Clean Waterways Act. And so I was going to start there um, and just give you an update on some things that we've completed and others that we will be working on in the future to complete. Uh, part of the Senate Bill 712 uh, really focused on wastewater and including um, not just like wastewater facilities, but also on-site sewage uh, disposal systems or septic tanks. And uh, one of the things that we had to have completed um, actually earlier this year on July 1 was a wastewater project report. And that would required us to evaluate um, all of the wastewater projects in our BMAP and provide them uh, a summary of the cost and benefits of what they, you know, the nutrient reductions that they would provide for each of the BMAP. And that report was completed in uh, on time and it can be found on our BMAP webpage. And if you're not sure where that is, we can um, maybe get somebody to put it in the chat. Um, I don't know, Jacinia, if you could do that or if I'm able to do that, I can do it for you. Um, so that is out there. We were also required to do a report on monitoring gaps in our BMAP. For all of our BMAPs, you know, a lot of the monitoring takes place by the stakeholders who are invested in these BMAPs, you know, the local government or uh, perhaps sometimes there's uh, environmental organizations or groups that provide some monitoring and all that information goes into how we uh, evaluate the progress of the BMAP. And we certainly have some gaps in, in many of our BMAPs, you know, because we do rely on the local stakeholders and sometimes they're not out in the areas perhaps where, you know, we could use additional monitoring or even just the frequency. Oftentimes, you know, uh, local governments may be on a quarterly monitoring basis and there might be the need for more frequent monitoring. So we did that analysis on each of our BMAPs. And again, that report is also available on our BMAP webpage. Um, that was another one that was due earlier this year in July or by July 1. So both of those are published and available for review. Um, let's see, we also uh, had to, um, well, these are gonna be due in the future. So we have some other plans uh, and information that are due in 2025. And that consists of doing an evaluation um, in our BMAP areas where we have nutrient BMAP um, of all of the wastewater and OSTDS. So looking at the discharges of the facilities, um, the nutrient levels that each of the facilities are uh, discharging, their capacity, you know, planning for future growth, really trying to do that kind of overall analysis of what does the wastewater look like in uh, for the local governments in these areas where we have BMAP. You know, are we putting our funding resources in the right places? Are there uh, facilities or areas where perhaps um, we need to shift funding to 
do more septic to sewer conversions or um, upgrades on septic systems because those are the areas that we really need to focus really getting the local governments to think about it like that so as we're updating our bmaps we're getting that information and those types of projects you know in the forefront of the bmaps to really bring them um, you know have progress occur in the in these uh, bmaps towards our water quality restoration goals um, you may recall that several years ago we had to put in our bmaps some milestones and uh, you know restoration goals over the next 20 years and so this is kind of a, the next step in my mind where they want us to focus on okay well what does wastewater look like and again that includes septic and uh, our central centralized uh, wastewater facilities and see, you know, what can we be doing there to make sure we're going to reach those milestones and goals. And it really has to happen at the local government level. And so we're working with the local governments to put these reports or this information, these summaries together. We're going to be starting some outreach uh, soon. Uh, some of our BMAP folks have already started talking to a few of the local governments, but we're really trying to pull together um, kind of a, a almost like a survey type thing where we could reach out to our local governments, especially utilities, um, you know, local utilities and get information that they have. Um, we don't we're hoping this isn't going to be like, you know, every local government's going to produce a 400 page report. You know, that's not really what we need. We really just need some basic information about what they've got currently, you know, what future growth they can handle and, um, you know, in a, in a more concise way that we can incorporate that somehow into our BMAPs. We haven't really um, settled on how that's going to occur because, again, we don't want to um, adopt, you know, 800, 400-page uh, reports into our BMAPs. Um, but so we're going to start that outreach process and talking to some folks to see, you know, what ideas they might have and what might work well for them as well. And we'll be doing that um, more and more uh, in early 2022 uh, with the goal of having all of these wastewater uh, remediation plans completed because we have to adopt them into somehow into our BMAPs by 2025, July 1, 2025. Um, let's see, our, um, we've also been doing, I think Angela was mentioning earlier, a lot of our um, BMP enforcement. So as the uh, Office of Ag Water Policy sent out all of those letters, you know, letting folks know what the requirements were, uh, if they're in a BMAP area, they need to be either enrolled in the BMP program or prefer performing monitoring um, on their location to uh, support that they are not, you know, violating water quality standards. Um, to date, no one has elected to do the monitoring. Um, so we've been working really closely with Chris and his folks on getting folks identified for uh, BMP enrollment. And for those uh, landowners who have not enrolled, um, DACs or, or the Office of Ag Water Policy uh, shifts those names and, and landowners over to DEP for enforcement. So we've been um, doing a lot of that over the last year, maybe you know eight to ten months. And uh, it started with the mail out that OAWP did. Um, to date, we have about 67 percent of the parcels that were referred to us, and that was a, initially uh, a total of 2,800 agricultural parcels that were sent to us for enforcement in May of this year. And we now have, have about 67% um, what we would consider either enrolled or in the, uh, in the process of getting enrolled. You know, Chris and, and some of his folks were talking earlier, I think it was Bonnie about, you know, the resources it has taken to do this. And um, so it has taken, taken time, but we're working closely with them to get um, folks in compliance. Um, we do have the ability if someone decides not to do either of those and they're just you know, holding strong and don't wanna do either, 
that we can take civil action against them um, and uh, assess fines um, for not being in compliance. We currently have one landowner that is on track for that occurring. Um, the information is currently with our Office of Litigation and OGC, uh, Office of General Counsel. Um, and let's see, we, uh, once we got through the um, kind of the initial slug, we've now got, um, uh, we've sort of binned out who's left, you know, so our, our process was a series of letters um, warning folks, hey, you really need to do this. Um, and then, you know, kind of being a little more forceful uh, with a second or third letter. Um, so we do have about, uh, I don't know, it's a pretty, say uh, about 800 or so folks that are still um, have been non-responsive basically. And so we bend them out into kind of, you know, their location, their size of their parcels, thinking that, um, you know, let's get the larger landowners first in compliance if we can. Um, we did a mail out for those folks that had uh, parcels um, over 100 acres, and that was about 30 or so. We've gotten most of them into compliance or, in, you know, on the way to compliance as far as getting enrolled. Um, and our next uh, mail out will be um, either folks that have, you know, maybe 50 to 100 acres, or we may actually shift to doing something more um, along the lines of, you know, where are these parcels located? Are, the, are they in hot spots? Are they in areas that we really need to prioritize? So we're looking at that right now. And I believe that's all I've got, Justinia. Thank you, Julie, for the update. Uh, we appreciate your participation. Uh, for now, I have posted the link to the main BMAP page in the chat, but as Angela mentioned and uh, Jessica mentioned in the chat, uh, we will be following up with more detailed notes and links. And we will see if there's any questions for you, Julie, during the Q&A session. So uh, take it away, Angela. Okay, thank you, Jessenia. Thank you uh, again, Julie. That's uh, very interesting information. And yeah, the, you can tell we have a, a lot of uh, meeting, talking, and uh, trying to work out a lot of uh, policy level issues going back and forth between us and DEP. Uh, next up, we are going to have updates by the water management districts, and Vanessa and I will be uh, sort of co-hosting this group, but we are going to start with Mike Register from St. John's River Water Management District. Uh, congratulations on the position of uh, Executive Director, Mike. It's great to have somebody with your experience in agriculture uh, at the helm. Take it away. Thank you. appreciate it. Um, and I'm excited about the opportunity to get to work with with the ag community and with DAX. Um, you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. We'll start off with talking about our Tri-County Agricultural Water Management. Um, it's a collaboration you know, with DEP, FDAX, and St. John's, and these partnerships address both water quality and supply there in the lower St. John's River area. Um, funding is provided to growers in Putnam, Flagler, and St. John's counties for projects that conserve water and reduce offsite nutrient loading. And we fund at 75% um, of the project cost with an annual cap of $250,000. Um, one of the most popular water supply projects in the area is converting seepage irrigation, which is the most commonly used um, irrigation technique there in that partnership area. Um, and converting that to sub-irrigation drain tile, um, some of the commonly referred to as ear drain. Um, and I think this is shown on the slide here. And we've gotten great reports on that where growers are reporting almost a 50% reduction in irrigation water use and also increased yields um, because they can uh, reduce the amount of land that's used for irrigation uh, burrows. Uh, fertile, uh, precision fertilizer equipment with GPS is also another popular project that helps us reduce the uh, nutrient loading by getting the fertilizer only um, in the right place and just the right amounts. If you could change the slide. Uh, and actually, UF conducted monitoring trials there in TCAA for a period of three years and developed some estimates here um, specific to the areas for the crops being grown. And between the three funding partners, the estimated benefits that are shown on the screen 
were realized um, because of this partnership with the growers. And it's estimated that approximately 25% of the land there in TCAA has been converted to this more efficient irrigation type in the past nine years. So we made excellent progress in that partnership area. Next slide. We also have our district-wide agricultural cost share program, which was started in 2015 and also addresses water supply and water quality outside of the TCAA. Uh, it also has the same funding with 75% uh, of construction costs up to uh, $250,000 per, per year. Um, popular projects outside have been things like pump automation, um, especially, uh, especially in uh, citrus, but also uh, in blueberries and container nurseries, soil moisture sensors, weather stations. Um, and so we've seen a big increase in the use of technology. Uh, in the area and uh, many growers are requesting this as a, a way of reducing their water use and, and re reducing their fertilizer rates. Um, next slide. Also just an update on cattle grazing leases. The district continues to lease out land for both cattle and apiary leases. Um, originally the district cattle leases were kind of inherited as a part of the land acquisition uh, or they originated from just a request from the adjacent landowner. Uh, since 2015, pursuant to statute, um, the district's been implementing a formal bidding process for awarding the cattle leases. And um, we currently have uh, about 30 revenue generating cattle leases over about 46,000 acres, um, representing about 4,100 animal units. Land is leased for cattle grazing in every region of the district, and the revenue is generated is used for land management purposes. The, the rates were at like $60 per animal unit, and the, after doing all the bidding, they're up to about $200 per animal unit. Next. Um, biosolids, always a, a big topic, but land application of biosolids um, in our district for the past couple of years has, has especially been a big topic. After monitoring, it indicated that there had been some increases in phosphorus loading in the upper basin. Um, Following the Biosolids Technical Advisory Committee recommendations, DEP has awarded the district a $1.9 million grant to evaluate the best ways to manage biosolids and minimize the migration of nutrients from these areas. We currently ha have uh, awarded three contracts, including more data collection in the watersheds with applied biosolids, a project with IFAS to evaluate nutrient movement as a, at a working ranch with a history of applications and to look at the feasibility of resource recovery at wastewater treatment plants to reduce the amount of nutrients that would be actually contained in the biosolids. And lastly, we're also, uh, we'll be evaluating environmental remediation techniques in the pastures with a long history of biosolid applications. Next slide. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about our water supply planning efforts, which is the area that I came from uh, prior to BNED, uh, which looked basically 20 years into the future for each plan each time it's updated. Um, it's conducted in an open and public process, including coordination with other agencies. And you know, components of water supply plans include population and water demand projections, and assessment of the available water supplies to determine if current and future demands can be met with traditional sources without harming Florida's natural resources. And if not, you know, the plan will also include management strategies, water conservation potential, and alternative water supply projects or water resource development projects that can meet these uh, the future needs. Um, plans also identify funding options and we update them every five years. Next slide. The one that we are currently working on is the Central Springs East Coast um, or CSEC, we call it, planning area. And it's one of the th three planning regions. It's the last one that doesn't have its own adopted water supply plan. We've already done the Central Florida Water Initiative plan and, uh, and an update to that plan. And then we've also already done in cooperation with Swanee River the North Florida Regional Water Supply Plan, and we're working on an update for that, um, possibly for next, I think it's next year's it's scheduled. Um, the CSEC contains all or part of six counties in our district, Volusia, Marion, uh, Northern Lake, Brevard, Indian River, and Okeechobee. Next. For those of you that don't know, one of the first exercises that's employed during water supply plan development is looking at historical uh, population and water use in order to develop that population and uh, water demand projections for the 20 year planning, planning horizon. This graphic shows both historic population and water use in addition to population and water demand projections.
projections for the CSEC planning area. Water use and demand is shown by the bars with colors representing the different water use categories, whereas the black line shows historic and projected population. Water use trends can also be impacted by climatic conditions and economic fluctuations. In addition, recent use um, and projected demands demonstrate how water conservation and expanded reclaimed water use have lessened the demand as the population continues to grow. So we've been able to get by serving more people with less um, water per person. Just a few uh, statistics about the planning region. It's expected to grow about 30% or by about 450,000 people by 2040, whereas water use is only expected to increase by 21% or 75 MGD. Um, public supply makes up 45% of that demand, followed by agriculture at 29% and landscape recreation at 13%. Next slide. Hey, Mike, just yeah. real quick, would you mind, could you try turning down your computer volume while you present? Sure. There seems to be a whistle and I think that might be causing it. So I'm just going to go back on mute and then let you keep going. All right, let me see if I can do that. Still trying to navigate it here. That's okay. Okay, we'll see if this helps. Uh, if you go to the next slide. One of the first things we really try to look at when we're looking to meet these future water demands is water conservation potential. And for this one, the district estimates, um, you know, how much water conservation could offset increases in projected demand. Uh, if these water conservation measures were implemented at the high conservation potential, um, the, the entire 75 million gallon a day increase uh, in demand from 2014 to 2040 could actually be reduced in half. And so implementing water conservation measures can often be the most cost effective uh, rather than constructing alternative water supply projects. As you can see, ag conservation projects are expected to result in a large portion of water savings uh, and cost share programs with FDAX and RCS and the district will help growers achieve these conservation goals. Next. Lastly, concluding about the, the CSEC plan, um, it concludes that the projected 75 MGD increase in water demand cannot be met with the traditional sources without predicted impacts to MFL water bodies, groundwater quality, and wetland function. Therefore, the plan has identified 229 million gallons per day of projects and measures that can be implemented, including conservation, um, to meet future demand while protecting these water resources and related systems. We anticipate this uh, water supply plan uh, being presented to our governing board um, e either in December or uh, in early in January or early part of next year. And that's all I have. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate that. Um, next up, we're going to hear from Swanee River Water Management District. Um, and I believe their executive director, Hugh Thomas, is on the line. And uh, Hugh, we have not been able to find Libby on the list, but since you're on twice, we're just going to unmute both of you. <laughs> okay. Uh, thanks, Angela. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Good. Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, well, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, greetings from Swanee. Um, I've got uh, Libby Smith, who heads up our ag team, um, on the, hopefully on the line as well. Um, and we're going to kind of tag team this. A, a thought because agriculture plays such a big part in our Swanee district um, that she could give a little more detail about, particularly about our uh, agricultural cost share programs. Um, for the benefit of those that are online. Um, I was gonna give a kind of a high level um, overview of, of the district and, and what we're involved with, similar to what Mike had presented. Um, we are in the effort of uh, uh, updating our water supply planning. Um, we hope to have that completed um, by December or January. We are looking at updates uh, in particular, uh, incorporating some of the new water use information from our utility groups, um, as well as some of the FSED data. Um, and that will certainly be incorporated into our um, status relative to our MFLs we are developing um, for our water bodies. Um, I'll have a little bit more information about that in a few moments. 
Um, I'll have a little information relative to our ag culture programs. As I mentioned, Libby will be updating some of that. Um, but I do have a kind of a high level overview of some of the projects that we are looking at relative to our uh, prevention recovery strategies um, with that. And then certainly um, our water quality programs. I know Julie spoke to some of this earlier and um, working with DEP utilizing springs funding um, for a number of grants that we have uh, that thankfully from the legislature and DEP and the governor's office uh, approved to try and address some of the water quality concerns that we have for our springs as well as uh, water supply concerns. Um, next slide. Okay, certainly a big part of what we're doing, um, our staff at Swanee are involved with right now are developing our uh, minimum flows, and minimum water levels. Um, as you see here, it's our priority list. Uh, going forward, we're currently um, working on the Lower Santa Fe um, and Itchituckney um, MFL and Associated uh, Prevention Recovery Strategy with it. Um, uh, DEP, uh, because this is a joint um, uh, cross-boundary MFL um, and the initial MFL that's currently in place um, that was adopted in 2015. That was adopted by the Department of Environmental Protection as will this reevaluation uh, once completed. Um, and we go through that process. And uh, we're working with St. John's very closely. And um, Mike's a great guy to work with. Ann was great. Mike's a great guy to work with. Appreciate his, uh, and, and certainly support um, his appointment to that position. Um, and look forward to, uh, continuing a good working relationship with St. John's. Um, but we are working on that. We hope to have that completed uh, by spring. Um, DEP had a workshop on the 14th of October relative to rulemaking. It was the first workshop. And um, we are anticipating that DEP will have another workshop related um, to rulemaking in December. Um, that's tentative right now. We don't have a date, but certainly we'll publicize that once we uh, become aware of the set date for it. Um, we're also working on our middle and upper Swanee areas relative to MFL developments. We hope to have that uh, those MFLs developed uh, in, I was going to say January or February timeframe is what we're looking at right now of 22 um, and going forward. And you'll see some, um, at least relative to the Santa Fe, you'll see where we're at. Uh, with it, and then uh, certainly the associated outstanding Florida Springs um, in those uh, segments of the river. Next slide. This is some information I know a lot of you online have seen relative to the uh, status of the MFL for the Lower Santa Fe and Itchituckney uh, River area. Uh, currently, the evaluation associated with this um, is looking at uh, 2015 impact from water use. Um, and with that, with this reevaluation, um, the proposed MFL um, has moved the lower Santa Fe slightly out of the recovery status that it's currently in uh, or in the current MFL. Um, and the Itchituckney continues to be in a state of recovery with this reevaluation. Um, however, we are anticipating um, with these new water use uh, numbers uh, that'll be through uh, 2018, um, updating that uh, because that delta there between the prevention status and the recovery status is so slight for the lower Santa Fe, um, as we're thinking that it will probably have gotten closer to that recovery line or actually moved into it, but we'll know more as that data uh, becomes available. Um, and we incorporate it into our status evaluation with that. Next slide. Okay, so moving forward, we are working on trying to develop a prevention and recovery strategy, which uh, must be uh, adopted along with the MFL um, on this. And so um, with it, we've got a number of projects um, that we are looking at, um, really kind of high level where we're at with them is working um, to develop alternative water supplies. Uh, the legislature has, has uh, given us some funding for that. 
Um, we actually have some projects on the ground relative to uh, alternative water supply uh, with some um, uh, municipality projects as well as with agriculture. Um, looking at aquifer recharge projects um, within our district, um, as well as partnering with St. John's on aquifer recharge projects, and then land acquisition, um, changes in land use, and then uh, conservation easements. Um, you'll hear a little bit more about that in just a moment. But from a regulatory perspective, working with DEP to develop the regulatory strategies, um, we've had outreach meetings and will continue to do so um, relative to uh, looking at um, uh, offsets that will be required associated with uh, water allocations uh, going forward, um, renewal of water allocations, as well as increases in water allocations and new permits um, with it. Swanee's been involved in partnering with DAX um, and NRCS for a number of years relative to improving the efficiency um, ITIS has played a big part of this in, in helping perform some of the research and outreach efforts. Um, I know Dr. Dukes uh, uh, and Bob Hockmuth and a number of others have been involved um, in research efforts um, trying to improve the efficiency of water use relative to agriculture. Um, but we also are addressing that with our municipalities, public supply, um, trying to make improvements in the uh, efficient use of water. Um, and, and eliminating waste. Um, high pressure in guns, those are the inefficient part of a, a pivot for the most part, whenever those systems on the in, uh, the in guns on those systems uh, at the very end, um, in some cases they represent 10 to 10 to 11 percent of the acreage um, that are uh, that's utilized for productions. There's other means of being able to irrigate those areas um, outside of high pressure in guns. Um, so in our areas that uh, have water shortages, um, we are looking at restricting the use of those high pressure in guns um, in those areas. Looking at the, the duration limits on permits, um, as well as uh, increasing reporting requirements. Right now, our reporting requirements from a water use perspective um, have a threshold of 100,000 gallons per day uh, or uh, an inside diameter for a well casing of eight inches or greater. Um, we are looking at uh, considering that, uh, dropping it down to six inches um, and, and, and just evaluating um, potential benefits of being able to have that additional data. We do appreciate the support. I know Chris mentioned earlier, um, the mobile irrigation labs, um, they play a big part, at least for agriculture with this in, uh, in our district um, in helping to document the water savings um, associated um, through these conservation efforts um, and, and we continue to want to embrace with the utilization um, by the agricultural community with the mobile irrigation labs and highly support that. Next slide. Thank you. Mention some of the projects that we've got. Um, right now we've got about 20 projects identified in our prevention recovery strategy. Um, Again, these entail some of the projects in the St. John's district as well because of cross boundary um, uh, criteria with this. And for our public supply and commercial industrial, um, we are looking at improving the potential for utilization of reclaimed water. Um, how does it make the most sense? Um, is it to put it back out uh, from a municipal use or uh, do we have ag operations in the area that it would fit well with their uh, operational plans um, to utilize that reclaimed water? Um, certainly looking at the efficient, efficiency improvements um, that I mentioned and also reducing um, lawn irrigation. We don't have a lot of that in Swanee. We do have some, um, but certainly working with our uh, neighbors to the east, they have a lot prettier lawns than what we typically do in the Swanee district. Um, but uh, working with that, and then um, with agriculture, I won't go into much detail with it, uh, but we do have some programs identified, our Sustainable Swanee um, Pilot Project, which is where we look at um, transitioning uh, the agricultural land use uh, from a, an intensive production, intensive from the means of fertilizer use and also irrigation use uh, to a lower intensity. We've had some producers that have participated in that program um, that have transitioned 
from, and this is fit within their business plan, um, but have transitioned from growing corn um, to growing um, grass and going to a, a cow-calf rotation, um, and then incorporating uh, like a peanut rotation into that as well. Um, and looking at that long-term, our accelerating Swanee program, um, this is a program where we are looking at the uh, trans, uh, transitioning land use from uh, crop production, um, potentially into managed civiculture, um, managed uh, to the end of uh, uh, additional aquifer recharge. Uh, Matt Cohen, I think a lot of folks online are, uh, are familiar with the work, some of the work that Matt Cohen has done. He's continuing to do some work as well um, with it. And then Libby will have some additional information also. Next slide. <clears throat> I mentioned the uh, uh, accelerating Swanee. Some of the things that we are looking at, and this is some of the work that Matt had, uh, was involved with, I believe uh, back whenever Ann Shortell was here at Swanee, um, five of the, the five water management districts along with DAX uh, uh, funded some studies by University of Florida um, to evaluate how we could get enhanced recharge. Um, the Swanee has taken on um, enhancing that work um, and trying to follow it up with uh, some additional management strategies, um, evaluate the benefits of that. Uh, and so Matt is currently involved with it. He presented to our board a number of uh, weeks ago um, to look at what the benef potential benefits may be and hoping to identify that. Um, but this has got widespread application, not only across Swanee, um, but certainly across the state, I think, whenever we get to a final product with it. But it does look at a tiered approach, um, and certainly that could be an incentivized approach to looking at um, longer durations uh, or shorter uh, rotations for the crops. It could be increased thinning of the, uh, the trees themselves, depending upon the business plan. Certainly the, uh, the uh, largest benefit that's been identified so far is uh, in, uh, enhanced understory control um, with reducing the amount of understory vegetation and hence uh, enhancing um, the aquifer recharge by reducing the evapotranspiration um, that goes on. Um, so there are a number of, of uh, tiers that could be addressed through this program. From a high level, this particular program, depending upon certainly on the number of uh, acres that are involved with it, it can have tremendous benefit. Um, to it, helping us to achieve our recovery strategy um, for areas that we've got water shortages in. Um, you know, and each of the districts have a large amount of civiculture, um, but it is going to need to work within the, the uh, landowners uh, business plan. Um, we've had some discussions with the Forestry Association and some of the challenges with it. Um, and so we'll see. Well, stay tuned with it. Uh, next slide. I think that's about it for me. And then if Libby, if you're on, you, you want to speak to the ag program? Yeah, Libby. Yes, sir. And I was going to say, Libby, now you have to make time because uh, I think you took up all of your allotted time. So we'll be, we'll be, we'll be moving. She could breeze through it in 15 seconds. Well, you know. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Libby. Everybody. Thank you. Um, you can go to the next slide then. Um, concept of time is just different than the rest of it. <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. <laughs> um, so we go to the 2019 estimated groundwater use. This uh, came out of the district. This is our, our newest uh, pie chart of our use. Um, when you compare this chart to the 2015 chart, uh, it's very similar. There's been really not much change in the category use of water in the district. Um, the only major change was in the last five years, we've added about 10 million gallons per day in usage but it's been kind of distributed amongst all of the different uh, water use categories. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, this is the 2021 water supply planning areas on the left. Um, the panel on the left shows the broader picture of the district and how it's divided. The uh, sage color on the right on the eastern side is the eastern water supply planning area. Uh, the black hatched area on the west side of the Swanee River is our western supply planning area. So we, we divide the district essentially in half that way. 
And then on the right panel, we drive into the B maps. We have the, the blue area there is the Santa Fe B map. And then the purple is the Swanee uh, B map, Swanee River B map. Um, the areas in yellow and green are our priority springs focus areas. So we're looking at ag cost share. If we have producers that have their, their operations within those uh, orange uh, bounded areas, uh, they will be areas that we're most concerned with in terms of our springs protection. Next slide. So the estimated acreage by county, this was um, generated by the USGS 2020 crop survey that completed last fall. Uh, it's preliminary data at this point, but it shows that what they've seen in the field is our estimated acreage that's irrigated by county in the district. Um, if we look at the um, irrigated acreage, we see uh, roughly four counties uh, represent uh, roughly 65% of the irrigated acreage uh, of the whole district. So there's really about four counties that really are doing most of the irrigating. We have other counties that we have very little impacts there. Uh, next slide, please. So we look at the, um, the FZ8, uh, the newest FZ model, and we look at Swanee standing out uh, with a projected change of 20% increase in irrigated acreage as we compare that to the other four districts. Um, Northwest is set to increase. Uh, St. John's and, and Southwest and, and St., uh, South Florida seem to be minimal change or maybe going a little in the other direction. So what that's telling us at the district is that we really need to prepare as best we can right now to, to be able to do the best we can with this added you know, irrigated acreage. What can we do in cost share to to maximize our water conservation, knowing this is coming. Um, next slide, please. So in 2012, the governing board uh, put out forward an initiative to provide funding and, and seek funding from the district uh, to provide agricultural cost share through an application evaluation process to implement and fund projects with three critical goals. One was the, um, to improve irrigation efficiency in their irrigated acreage improve their nutrient management, and to implement water and nutrient conservation practices. So to bring in new technologies um, to actually hedge off and improve our ability to manage our farms uh, in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So the Ag Cost Share program as we run it daily, um, we have two main programs. You talked about, you know, there's a lot of other programs, we'll get on those a little bit, but this is our bread and butter programs. Uh, the Precision Ag Cost Share Program addresses nutrients primarily, and it allows for 75% cost share on eligible products projects up to $300,000 over five years for a producer will have an opportunity for that much money over five years. Um, all of the elements of the pyramid here, with the exception of the side dressing equipment, is cost share on services. So if the producers want to do aerial imagery, tissue sampling, their, their soil characterization mapping, all of those are cost shared um, at a 75%. And then if they wish to uh, purchase side dressing equipment, that can be either liquid or dry side dressing equipment, we go up to $50,000 uh, typically on that. Unless we have a producer that has a very, very large acreage and would maybe qualify for something a little more expensive in equipment wise. So that's our nitrogen program for the most part on our everyday programming. And then the next slide, please, will show the uh, irrigation or what we call the BMP cost share program. So this addresses our water conservation efforts. Um, we cost share 75 to 90 percent to on eligible projects up to 300,000. So essentially, if you put these together, uh, a producer has the ability to get about $600,000 over five years to work on their nutrients and their water. Um, the 90% cost share here covers the soil moisture probes, the purchase of those, and also their center pivot retrofits are cost shared at 90%. Those are very popular with our producers. We, we like to see they're using soil moisture probes and also making their center pivots more efficient. Again, there are several things on here. I think some of what the other district has as well, the weather station, St. John's mentioned weather stations. Uh, in, talked about the in-gun shutoffs, remote controls. Um, any of these things can be cost shared in our normal program. And this is really not competitive. We have, they have to be eligible to participate in these programs, but it's not a selection process. 
Next slide. Other available cost share, and this is pretty much what Hugh was, was talking about before a bit. Um, we're really looking for alternative water supply or AWS to for producers to have a way to reuse their water. Uh, we have nurseries like nursery tailwater is a good example of what we've funded for that. Also dairies, um, and that kind of kind of overlaps with the dairy wastewater system upgrades where we upgrade the wastewater systems to the point that we can reuse that water they can reuse that water for irrigation for crops. And so those kind of tie together. Um, the springs protection, the, depart, the FDEP uh, springs program, this has been very valuable for larger projects for us that really don't fall under the other projects. This can also include such as land acquisitions, uh, protection of lands in that, in that way. So this, this program has been very helpful to us in allowing us some flexibility on special projects. Um, next slide, please. So this is the kind of an overview from the inception of the, the four different uh, programs. Currently, we have 130 plus contracts that Jonathan Crane and myself manage. Um, that's typical for a year at Swanee. Uh, we'll run anywhere between 150 and 200 ag cost share contracts a year. Um, we see here the funding breakdown of how much funds are either been spent or allocated or currently allocated in contract. So the district cost share we see is up there around, you know, six and a half million dollars have been spent uh, within the last 10 years. Uh, the fertigation is a relatively new program through DEP. The AWS pivot retrofits is a very new program that we maxed out that money last year. Um, Precision Ag again has been going since about 2017. Okay, next slide please. So Pew touched on these. This is our land, agricultural land conversion initiatives. And we talk about high input to low input, and that can take on several different faces, as we see with these programs. Um, Accelerating Swanee is a program where we're literally going after converting high input uh, irrigated corn uh, type you know, areas to cow calf or or limited silvicultures or grass or you know something to really go from high to low and this can incorporate either a conservation easement which will be perpetual or it may be a 10-year limited uh, agreement where they get you know lci payments you know conversion payments for going out of high production for say 10 years uh, we recently got into a memorandum of agreement with alachua conservation trust and they are currently negotiating and helping us. Uh, we're working together with them to uh, negotiate some of these agreements with producers in the Lower Santa Fe and Nichitoqui Trace area to address our MFL issues there. Sustainable Swanee, we've got quite a bit uh, number of things going on with this funding source. Um, the five-year four hours program with the, the, the North Florida Research and Education Center with Bob's group there. Um, they got some a lot of equipment, the high boy. Uh, sprayer, they've got uh, trucks and trailers and going around and doing on-farm projects over a period of five years. I think they were expecting to do about 15 farms over that time. And so this is an opportunity for producers to go out and see this equipment uh, using the control release fertilizer, using the soil moisture probes. It has the whole kind of the conservation farming that we want to see in the future is being demonstrated by IFAS over this five-year period. Um, this particular year, uh, this, this study is, is finally finishing up right now. That was the on-farm control release fertilizer on corn. Uh, Bob's group has done a lot with control release. I think he said earlier with his watermelons and carrots. Um, we're very interested. They're very interested in, in seeing how this will work on corn. So the district was able to get into an agreement and, and Dee Broughton and the group at there at North Florida Rec uh, have done that program very well this year. And that you know, the outcome from that study is, is essentially going to be some of the basis for maybe looking at cost share down the road and, and incentivizing the use of control release fertilizer once the research you know, shows us how to do it and, and where it works and where it doesn't. Uh, currently we have two producers enrolled in the sustainable swanee program in a 10-year incident program that converted from high input uh, irrigated corn to cattle. Um, so then the other face of this 
low input. We talk about dairies and converting dairies. Well, we've gone to freestall barns where we've got cows under, under on concrete and, and under cover. All of the water and all of the output from the cattle can be collected into these large lagoons. Their waste is then treated. It has, we're improving the size of these lagoons. They're lined lagoons, so we don't have cows you know, out in sinkholes and out in lakes and stuff on the property. So these lagoons are lined. They, the, the water can be treated that way. The nitrogen can be reduced and we have screen separators where we can take that water and now put it onto the pivot system and whatever residual nitrogen is there can be actually used for fertilizer. But the key here is that we are reusing the dairies, the input water through the dairy actually out into the fields and using it to irrigate. So and essentially we're taking a, a high input of nitrogen in a dairy to very low input uh, footprint for a dairy as we move forward. Um, currently we have three large dairies that are in contract right now to have these two wastewater treatments done and for the reuse crop irrigation. Okay, next slide. I think this might be the last one. Just quickly, partnership update. Um, again, we're working with the Electrical Conservation Trust. They've been excellent partners for us. Um, Tall Timbers, this awesome project in Osceola Springs, um, the Scylla River, um, the increased flows. There's ecological benefits and public access. Um, leveraging the partnership with the land trust has been very important uh, for us in the district to, to be able to do things that we couldn't probably do by ourselves um, the swanee river partnership they just going to announce they have we have a new website uh, you can visit the swanee river partnership.com that's uh, brand new there's some videos on there and uh, they've just done a beautiful job in putting that together with the public outreach um, and then wanted to announce real briefly that the this Farm Cares, the CARES celebration was canceled last year because of COVID and this year we're going to be honoring the 2020 awardees as well as the 2021 awardees for the CARES program. Um, it's gonna be quite a bit smaller event this year. Uh, it's gonna be a lunch, but uh, we're just glad that we can finally get that going again. So we really appreciate our partners. I'm sure I missed some people here, but uh, we certainly appreciate all of our partnerships. Um, I think that's it. Slide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, both uh, Hugh and Libby. Um, now we're going to hear from Northwest Florida, uh, Brett Cyphers, their executive director is on the line to talk to us this morning. Go ahead, Brett. You'll need to unmute yourself, Brett. How's that? Oh, there we go. Now I can hear you. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. I was uh, led to believe that uh, Chris was paying by the word today. So um, buckle up, folks. Uh, it's going to be a long one. I'm kidding. Um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide, please. For those of you who just moved to Florida today, um, this gives you a little information on Northwest Florida. I think everyone, at least almost everyone on this call, except for that person who just moved here, um, uh, knows uh, Northwest Florida, the riverine corridors in which the district owns about 225,000 acres, uh, and we have more than 250 springs. Next slide. So let's get down to brass tacks on uh, Jackson Blue Spring. That's the B map that we have that is uh, a largely agricultural uh, in source. So, Sorry, I'm moving your handy bar out of the way of the words here. <clears throat> so the BMAP target for total nitrogen reduction in, in uh, that area in red is 651, nearly 652,000 pounds. Uh, next slide, please. You can see uh, going back to 2001, you can see the trend is kind of up uh, over the first years, we began this program that we're talking about today in terms of, and we'll get to that in just a minute, um, but that trend is uh, pretty high. We're about, we've got a, a big lift to make, uh, 600, over 600,000 pounds of nitrogen is a lot to have to reduce. Uh, and that's kind of where we sit if you look at it uh, on a graph. Uh, next slide, please. That last little bit of that, 
this might put in a nice uh, graphic that basically shows the years since 2013, 2014, where one Angela Chalette uh, created uh, our program here at the Water Management District um, was actually trending down uh, some. And so it, it gets to a, a broader subject related to uh, this particular spring shed uh, as we get, as we go along in the presentation here. Next slide, please. So uh, having acronym NB uh, from St. John's and Southwest and Suwannee, we came up with our own. It only took uh, eight years uh, to come up with one. Uh, so it's Precision Agriculture Solutions and Systems. Partly it's just to, one is we like acronyms because we're government. And two is to, is to draw a distinction. There's sometimes confusion on behalf of uh, folks that we work with in Northwest Florida over uh, BMPs, which are a thing, and the PASS, uh, which is an actual program uh, that often incorporates many of those things. But usually when people think of uh, BMP, they think of the official Department of Ag and Consumer Services uh, uh, program. So since 2013, we're, we've uh, had the ability to get nearly $10 million uh, with Springs funding from uh, DEP. Uh, we've done 122 projects with 91 producers, and that's 90% of every irrigated acre in the Jackson Blue Bee Map. So what we have is a really nice representation. Farmers over here are excited and interested uh, in this program, and we've expanded it uh, since our early days because of that, that interest and that participation. Next slide. So what, what do we get for that? Uh, and the answer is about 25% of, of water use uh, in that area, as well as 668,000 pounds of reduction. So if you remember the, the number from earlier before, which is our target, uh, this will seem like a very big number. Uh, and that's because it is. Uh, we've got great response from farmers. We continue to expand, uh, and, and the same technologies are the ones that uh, that Mike and, and Hugh were, uh, did a great job of articulating. We're talking about the same thing plus whatever comes next, and that's what we leave ourselves open to. And we're grateful to, to DEP for giving us the, the room uh, to uh, evolve as uh, farm technology evolves. The point is we've had a great response thus far. The problem that we have, the challenge that we face is that the nutrients, the background nutrients from years past in that system sometimes take a month to make it to uh, Jackson Blue Spring. And sometimes we think can take as much as 17, 18 years. Uh, that creates an interesting um, conundrum in that we're reduced the amount of nitrogen going on the ground uh, by 668,000 pounds, but that's not going to necessarily show up for some time at Jackson Blue Spring. Uh, and so when you have a target uh, like we do and the requirement attached to it in 20 years, that requires some explanation. And so we'll continue to do the, the past technologies and expand those, uh, the technologies individually on each farm. But beyond that, we've got to do more groundwater study to figure out depending on where those farms are, where are the places that we can expect to see uh, the difference at the spring and that short period of time, as well as the long period of time, because folks like DEP uh, and uh, Chris and OAWP are gonna be interested in seeing that, that progress happen. Uh, we'll be getting close to the deadline and it may show that we're not quite there, but it's not for a lack of the actual participation the actual progress uh, and the reduction of, of nutrients. It'll be from uh, geological considerations uh, outside of the control of these farmers. Next slide. Just to add in uh, an extra note, and this has been the case since 2012, 2013, is the district has always seen, with the support of DEP, has always seen the Jackson Blue Bee map as a community issue. Uh, we realize and farmers realize and people in Jackson County who are not farmers realize uh, that septic tanks are not the biggest issue 
for uh, for that spring in terms of the need for nitrogen reduction. However, what the folks have, have done over there is participate in the improvement of this spring as a community. And that has included uh, septic to sewer conversions. You can see Indian Springs uh, sewer. That's a, a neighborhood right next to Merritt's Mill Pond, which is the pond of the spring. And so you'll see the, the, the amount of nitrogen re that's reduced based on those projects, including Malone, are not immense, especially when you're talking about uh, six figures on the, the farm side, but it's important from a community standpoint, and it's one that, that we like to, to accentuate. Next slide. And there you go. Thanks, Angela. Thank you so much, Brett. I really appreciate it. Uh, next, we are going to move to South Florida and hear from Ms. Libby Pigman. Are you able to... Good morning. Thank you. Sound check? Yep, we can hear you. Thanks, Libby. Good, thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to give an update from South Florida Water Management District. Today, I'm going to be speaking about some of our Northern Everglades watershed projects. Next slide, please. Um, the map that you're seeing shows some of the uh, projects in the Northern Everglades watershed. Uh, we recently completed the Kissimmee River restoration construction um, phase, and we had a ribbon cutting. We'll see a picture of that in a moment. Um, the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project, or LOPE, is also a project uh, just north of Lake Okeechobee in Clades County that we're working on. We're working on dispersed water management and public-private partnerships. And the Lakeside Ranch stormwater treatment area has one, been one of the shining stars north of Lake Okeechobee for phosphorus removal. The photo that you see um, on the right is um, Ben Butler, who's our governing board member in the Okeechobee area. And that is at a um, demonstration of a, our ASR well drilling project. And we are actually drilling some of those ASR wells right now as we speak. Next slide, please. This is from the Kissimmee River Restoration Project ribbon cutting. Uh, 44 miles of historic river channel has been restored to natural flow. It was the largest river restoration project in the world. And we had the ribbon cutting on that in July of this year. Next slide, please. The Lope Project is north of Lake Okeechobee in Glades County. Um, this project is going to include 55 ASR wells um, that will store approximately 308,000 acre feet of water per year. And there will be two wetland restoration sites that are shown in green, which will restore 5,800 acres of wetlands. Next slide, please. This is an example of a public-private partnership that we have with Likes. This is the West Waterhole Project. It is 2,500 acres and it's in the Indian Prairie Basin. Next slide, please. This slide is the Buck Island Ranch. It is a passive project in the Lake Okeechobee watershed. It retains stormwater in a network of ditches and pastures. It's been operational since May of 2012 and it has a project area of 3,748 acres. Next slide, please. Next is Dixie Ranch, and that's also a passive project in the Lake Okeechobee watershed. It retains stormwater in ditches and on unimproved pasture lands, and it's been operational since 2012 and has a project area of 3,771 acres. Next slide, please. This is Dixie West, also a passive project that retains stormwater in ditches and pasture lands, and it's a 1,400 acre project. Next slide, please. This is a project that we just recently put out to bid uh, in the lower Kissimmee Basin. It's a stormwater treatment project. Um, we are currently negotiating with a company called Ecosystem Investment Partners. And this project is important because we recognize that we need more storage and water treatment north of Lake Okeechobee. Um, 
and this will operate year round as a flow through system and it's a performance based contracting approach and so we're wor really working on these public private partnerships and that's what i really want to highlight today next slide please now the northern everglades um, also includes the Caloosahatchee River and estuary. These are some projects that we have currently um, ongoing in the Caloosahatchee River and estuary. Obviously, the um, Mac Daddy of this Caloosahatchee River is the C43 West Basin Storage Reservoir. Um, but we're also working on BOMA. We have some test cells there and we're doing some interim storage. Lake Hitchie phase one is online and we're working on uh, design of phase two. Next slide, please. We also have the St. Lucie estuary. We have another large, very, very large STA that is getting ready to come online. We're gonna be doing the ribbon cutting on that this month, the C44 STA. Um, we have Calkins Water Farm, which is a public private partnership. Alapata Flats, which is a natural lands restoration on lands that the district has acquired. Bluefield Grove Water Farm is the picture that you see. That was the ribbon cutting that we had in August of this year. And C23 and C24 is a SERP project that is under design as we speak. Next slide, please. <laughs> um, you can see the Bluefield Grove Water Farm uh, ribbon cutting there and um, information about that project as well. There's a, um, a map of it. That is a large scale stormwater storage and treatment project. It has a 6,000 acre project footprint and it reduces nutrient loads and excess surface water discharges from the C23 basin into the St. Lucie estuary. Um, the estimated average annual project benefit is 28,360 acre feet of year and it will uh, remove 5.12 metric tons per year of phosphorus. Next slide please. Coming soon the Scott Water Farm ribbon cutting that's actually tomorrow so we're very excited about that. This is um, a project that will be on a prior citrus operation by Evans. It's a large-scale stormwater storage and treatment project. It's 7,000 acres of a project footprint, and it will reduce nutrient loads and excess surface water discharges from the C25 basin into the Indian River Lagoon. Next slide, please. This is the map of our current dispersed water management programs, and I obviously couldn't cover all of them, but you can see um, that we have a lot in the Northern Everglades. And these are projects that we work with ag producers and landowners to store water on their lands. And it treats water in the regional system. It promotes hydrologic enhancement, groundwater recharge and habitat improvements. It avoids the district having to acquire land at a high cost and it keeps the private lands on local tax rolls. And um, it provides treatment and storage that will exceed the permit requirements of BMPs. It's, it's in excess and above that. Next slide, please. So here's the exciting rollout. Uh, we are in the process of um, releasing the RFP for the Northern Everglades Watershed Project. We will um, be announcing uh, this release within the next couple of weeks and then a week after that the RFP will go live and you will be able to access it and submit your projects and then the responses will be due in early January and what we're looking for is um, large projects small projects um, if you have an idea of how you can partner with the district for storage on your lands we want to hear from you and we'd like for you to be able to, um, you know, if you if you have 150 acres to be able to put pencil to paper and give us your ideas and um, we can evaluate it. And then when we get funding, uh, we can say, oh, we have a partner here that's looking to do a project in an area where we have a basin that needs some improvements and some storage. So, um, you know, please uh, participate. And if you know someone, 
that might be eligible to participate or interested in participating, spread the word. Um, we're asking that if people do want to submit projects, that once the project goes live, that they work with our procurement team. Our procurement team is able to answer questions. They can work with people on submitting their projects. Um, so we're, we're excited about this. We know we need more storage north of Lake Okeechobee. We need about a million acre feet more of um, storage projects north of the lake. We need to reduce phosphorus uh, going into the lake. So um, spread the word and, and we're excited about this RFP. And with that, I think my presentation is concluded if anyone has any questions. Okay, yeah, thanks Libby, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, we're asking everybody to hold their questions for just a minute, but uh, you might have some on that RFP. Huh? We'll see how okay. that goes. Thanks Angela. Thank you. Um, and batting cleanup is gonna be our Southwest Florida folks. Uh, we have uh, Jeff Wilton, uh, Carol Estes, and uh, April Breton. So uh, you guys can take it away. Okay, super. Uh, can I get a comms check real quick? Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine, Jeff. Super. Okay. Well, first of all, Brian, uh, our executive director, Brian Armstrong, asked me to send along his regrets for not being able to make it today. I think the, the change in dates presented a conflict in the schedule that he couldn't work around. Um, so, uh, with that said, this is going to be a very quick update. This is going to be far more down in the trenches than, you know, the, the, the great presentations that we had earlier. Um, so just have a few little bullet items and then I'll pass it along to uh, the other guys in the group here. But wanted to mention our, our Ag Swim program. And for those of you who don't know what our Ag Swim program is, this is basically an exemption verification program at its core, but we utilize the NRCS. We provide funding for the NRCS to, to provide farm plans for our agriculture producers in our areas. And these utilize a very rich suite of best management practices that ultimately come together to, pre, uh, to uh, provide this great sustainable farming operation for our producers in the area. It's a proactive outreach to farmers. Uh, this helps us avoid the challenges to the statutory exemption uh, on one hand. And, you know, it also opens the door to talk about other district programs, such as our farms programs or our mobile irrigation labs or, uh, you know, other programs like that, that we can bring to those site visits and talk with the farmer and, you know, and, and sell these, these great ideas. Uh, this is a very popular program at our district. It's sort of the flagship of what we do, and it's even written into our applicant's handbook as, as a rule. Uh, but we have just uh, come up upon a, a contract rewrite renewal. I guess that's just about done right now with the NRCS, and that presented its own challenges this time around due to the staffing issues that, uh, that they're having within their organization. And I, I don't know, I didn't see any NRCS staff on the call today. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's great having those folks uh, supporting this program. Um, so we'll go on to our mobile irrigation labs. Just wanted to mention our, our two uh, labs that we have. One is a lab operated by uh, NRCS as well as the Action uh, We provide funding for this as well. And, and that's, they really do the, the bulk of our mobile irrigation lab work in our district. But we also have a privately outsourced mobile irrigation lab that really specializes in uh, water use compliance uh, site visits, uh, troubleshooting. It's uh, very solution oriented and we can also use that privately outsourced mobile irrigation lab for uh, relatively smaller, uh, you know, engineering challenges that growers might face on the ground, such as discharge, you know, points and, and, and that sort of thing, sediment and erosion control. Um, uh, we also, I just wanted to mention that uh, the workload right now, and, and this is probably common to all the districts, I'm sure, but we have an extremely high uh, workload right now in our ERP section. Um, the last number I think I heard was was over a thousand applications uh, in house, which is uh, which is crazy. And the ag team is feeling that also. Uh, we have uh, you know we the ag team is Mark Lupty and myself, and we handle the, uh, the the you know any permits, exemptions, compliance activities uh, for the agriculture. Uh, community in our 16 counties. So it, it is quite a lot of work, but we're happy to do that. Uh, you know, we do provide specific focused outreach to our ag producers. And like I said, we are, we are proud of that. And uh, you know, speaking of the ag team, I, I just want to mention that, uh, you know, for those of you who know Mark Lutke, uh, I just want to mention that he is retiring in uh, just a few months, I believe uh, April, May timeframe. And uh, 
you know, we're going to be losing 35 years of institutional knowledge with him retiring. Uh, so, but unless he changes his phone numbers, I, I know where he, uh, I know how to get a hold of him. But, uh, you know, if, if Charlie Miller was the grandfather of Ag Swim, you know, back in the late 80s, really, then, then Mark is the father of Ag Swim. So, you know, we're going to really miss him there. And, and, you know, besides him being that, he's also a, a great coworker and a great friend. So uh, with that said, you know, we're wishing him a very happy retirement. And you guys out there, reach out to him in the next few months and, and let him know that you're, you're going to miss him. Uh, so with that said, uh, I will turn it over to April to see if she has any comments from her What Are You section. Um, just to talk briefly, I mean, really not uh, much on CFWI, just that the uh, um, FDEP will be implementing the rule. Well, we will be implementing the rule once it's um, finalized and posted by FDEP. So hopefully that will be soon. That's all I have. Um, Carol, you? Okay, I think I'm up to give a real brief summary of what farms and mini farms has been up to. Um, if you're just a quick view of what farms is, it's facilitating agricultural resource management systems. And that's our cost share program that's been around since about 2003. This year, we've it, it got kind of slow during the pandemic, but we've picked up and we've got a lot of interest coming up in the next year. Um, but in 2021, we did nine total projects and um, that contributed to our total of 226 total projects since 2003 with uh, an estimated groundwater reduction of nearly 30, a little bit more than 30 million gallons per day. Five of our projects became operational, so now we've got 203 operational projects, and some of our projects have been in operation since 2003 or 2004 or 5. So we, while we require them to be in, in operation for between five and seven years, there's plenty that have been um, in operation for much longer than that. But anyway, for our 203 operational projects, we have reduced groundwater use by nearly 25 million gallons a day. Our program is primarily focused on water quantity uh, reductions. Um, we're just starting to get into the um, nutrient retention and reduction uh, funding district wide. We were doing a little bit of that up in the Springs area, but the agricultural, uh, the, the type of agriculture up there didn't tend to lend itself to our program all that much, but we're still trying to market that area and try and generate much more interest in those in those types of projects. But now we have the opportunity to um, fund nutri nutrient management in addition, if it has that groundwater reduction component. We have our, our foremost goal is groundwater reduction, you, reduction in use of groundwater for irrigation. Anyway. Our mini farms program has been just going gangbusters this past year. We started the fiscal year 21 with a $150,000 budget for mini farms. Mini farms will fund up to 75% of uh, costs for smaller projects and on smaller farms. Um, it has a cap of $8,000. So it's mainly soil moisture sensors, some groundwater um, pump automation, that sort of stuff. But we were able to increase our budget mid-year to about 300000 for mini farms, and we uh, got 49 projects approved. The 22, FY22 budget will be 250000 and we'll see how that goes. And, but we've had a lot of interest so far in terms of getting projects approved and, and in the ground. Carol, I'm um, sorry to, to rush you, but if you could please wrap it up. I, I let Hugh talk too long, so. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I think I only have two more slides and I'll go pretty quickly through it. Uh, next slide. Um, I was just going to say the majority of our projects are alternative water supply. We get our most, uh, hot, our most of our groundwater reductions through these um, and we get about 30% reduction in groundwater use with each project. Uh, we've partnered with FDAX on design costs and NRCS with uh, pumpage and pump station and excavation costs. So this is a, a great place to 
interact with other agencies. And finally, our conservation projects. These are only about 22% of our projects, and they don't we don't they don't make up a huge portion of our groundwater reductions, but they're they're really good projects in addition to the alternative water supply. And that's it for me. So okay. Thank you so much, Carol, and the other folks from Southwest too. I, I will, I will know next time to uh, put Hugh at the end so I can ride herd on on him. So, uh, we really do appreciate all the water management folks joining us and providing their updates, and are looking forward to working with all of you uh, and the rest of the district staff members in the next year. Um, next up, we're going to have the NRCS update, and Chris is going to do the introductions there. Chris, are you on? Sorry about that. Oh, there you yeah, are. Yeah, I was having trouble getting off mute. Um, and I, I, I understand that uh, Juan has not been able to uh, to join us. Juan Hernandez is the uh, the state conservation officer. Uh, he is relatively new to the state. I know he's been doing uh, again whirlwind tours, and uh, we've been we've been collaborating with NRCS on any number of different issues. We've been engaging on. Uh, the updates to their practices on the national level and how it uh, relates down to, to Florida. Um, we continue to engage much like with the water management districts to ensure um, that the, uh, the, the various uh, cost share programs are best leveraged uh, to get the right projects where, where they need to be and work with the, uh, the, the great producers that we have the pleasure to collaborate with on the, uh, on the ground. Um, in, in lieu of one, uh, Nina, has joined us from uh, the grant section of the office, I believe. Um, I'm going to allow her to uh, to introduce herself and, and her background. Uh, Nina is just an absolute rock star as well. Um, we we regularly engage with her uh, to make sure that we're tying the the, the state program um, uh, that we operate under to what what goes on in the the federal arena and the the USDA programs. Um, you know, Florida is a little bit different, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this point a little bit uh, prior to questions, but Florida is a little bit different than the rest of the country where a lot of these conservation practices and projects are implemented through a conservation commission uh, and uh, conservation districts uh, in, the, uh, in the state of Florida. Uh, you know, the OAWP program is, is the, the first and primary uh, place for the, um, in, at least on the state level, for the, the best management practice and, and financial assistance and how to track that through the regulatory context. Um, we obviously uh, collaborate very closely uh, with NRCS as they implement their programs and, and of course the water management districts as they implement their programs tied um, well originally to, to water conservation now uh, also working continuing to work through the, uh, the water uh, quality and, and water resource protection uh, pieces that you you just heard. So it's it's all part of a big uh, a big pie, uh, and again, NRCS does a, a great job from the uh, the cooperative federalism uh, federal position. And with that, uh, Nina, I believe, uh, take us away. Yes, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, great. So this is Nina Bhattacharya. I'm the Assistant State Conservationist for Partnerships for NRCS, and Juan does send his apologies. Um, he had a conflict, but I am happy to provide the NRCS updates. Um, I'm, I believe everyone's familiar with NRCS, but for the few that may not be, we are the Natural Resources Conservation Service, a federal agency under the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, we do provide farmers, ranchers, forest landowners with both financial and technical assistance to voluntarily put conservation on the ground. So we have cost share programs and also conservation easement programs that we implement across the state and across the nation. So for the purpose of this presentation, um, I'll be providing, you know, some upcoming opportunities like dates to remember. I won't be doing a deep dive into our programs in terms of rules and, and so forth, but always encourage folks to get in touch with me if you have any questions and, and visit our website um, for more detail. And then I will also be covering just some upcoming strategies and initiatives I wanted to put on your all's radar. So with that, next slide, please. 
So these are just some important dates to keep in mind. Starting at the top, we do have a conservation stewardship program deadline for December 10th. And this is one of our cost share programs where producers can apply for assistance to implement you know, conservation practices and enhancements on their property, kind of taking their conservation efforts to the next level. So for interested landowners, they can apply through our local NRCS field offices. We also have an upcoming deadline for our agricultural conservation easement program. That'll be at the end of the year, December 31st. And this covers two types of easements, our wetland reserve easements. This is where landowners work directly with NRCS for, for NRCS to purchase conservation easement on their property. And this is for land that was historically wetlands um, that has been altered due to agricultural activities. And now at present day, landowners are willing to restore those properties to, the, to a wetland. Under this easement program, we also have agricultural land easements. And so those are easements where we work with partners such as state and local agencies, nonprofits, and Indian tribes to uh, provide matching funds for the purchase of an agricultural easement that's protected in perpetuity. So two important deadlines coming up. We also have our next state technical committee meeting on January 26th. Um, this is our primary advisory board for NRCS. Um, partners and producers are welcome to attend and provide their input into our programs. There are also gonna be two competitive grant opportunities coming out in 2022. The first one being for urban agriculture. So we are looking for urban farms from around the state to apply to become demonstration sites for NRCS practices. This grant opportunity is gonna be put out through grants.gov. Uh, timeline at this point is February, 2022, that it will be announced. And the uh, po uh, potential you know, application deadline will be April, 2022. We will be putting out news releases um, once that grants.gov posting is available. Another grant opportunity is for partners and producers through the Conservation Innovation Grants. And this is really a way for folks to kind of put forward innovative practices, management strategies, um, market strategies that can really push NRCS to that next level and keep us up to date on those innovative um, opportunities that, that should be on our radar. So that's uh, projected to go out in April um, for the announcement on grants.gov and the deadline being in June. And finally, uh, we will have signups for producers through urban agriculture, through our flagship program, the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Um, and we also have a new type of contract called Conservation in Incentives Contracts through EQIP, of which deadlines will be posted in 2022. So uh, next slide, please. I just encourage everyone to sign up for our news releases. So all the opportunities I just went through will be posted on our website and through the news release. And as I've mentioned, if you want information about our programs and, and, and the rules and policy, you can visit that website or um, contact me. So next slide, please. So I'm gonna give a little bit more information about our state technical committee and local working groups. As I mentioned earlier, these are really our, our primary advisory bodies that provide input in terms of natural resource and program priorities. Um, the way it works is that the state technical committee functions at that at state level, looking at our programs and providing input. We also have local working groups that can really tell us what's going on at that local level. And they are organized by our soil and water conservation district and also our NRCS field offices. So one of the big changes we've made over the last year is we've made this uh, the meetings a predictable schedule. So our partners and producers know our state technical committee is gonna meet twice a year. It's gonna meet every January and, and every June. And as I mentioned, the upcoming meetings on January 26. In addition, our local working groups from here on out will be meeting between October and November. So we actually have some going on now in, in this month. Um, and once those recommendations come in through the local working groups, we'll be presenting those at our upcoming state technical committee meeting. And you can see on this slide, some other items we'll be covering at that meeting. So we'll be discussing our program rollout um, for fiscal year 2022, um, put, putting a little bit more information in terms, terms of that upcoming funding opportunities. 
Um, we also have a new Florida wildlife strategy, a five-year plan that's coming out, and I'll provide a little information in, in the next slides. And finally, um, we have opportunities for partners to present at these meetings um, on any updates that you would like to, to provide to NRCS and others attendees. So um, you see my email address on this slide. Feel free to get in touch if you would like to present. Next slide, please. So urban agriculture, that's something that's really being um, pushed at the, at the national level from the department. And uh, we are looking very closely as to how to roll that out in Florida. So this slide provides some of the items that we are in the midst of doing. Um, first thing we ended up doing just a couple of weeks ago, had our first meeting for an urban agriculture subcommittee. And that is a subcommittee to our state technical committee meeting. Um, it advises NRCS on, on some of the things we need to be keeping our ears to the ground on regarding urban agriculture. I mentioned we're going to be having a sign up through the Environmental Quality Incentives Program and that we'll be having this competitive agreement opportunity for demonstration sites across the state. And of course we'll be conducting outreach and, and talking to our partners to leverage resources as we go through this initiative. So for those on the call who may be interested in learning more or have resources to share, please get in touch. Next slide please. And importantly, I did want to offer some of the conservation practices under urban agriculture that have been modified for a smaller scale operation. Um, that has been a challenge for us in the past in terms of implementation. And this is the first year where we're going to have scenarios available really for those urban ag small scale operations. So this is just a few practices to give you an idea, although we have um, additional ones to provide. So composting facilities, High tunnels, we've offered those for years, but now we have an op uh, option for smaller high tunnels or low tunnels. There's also pollinator mix, conservation crop rotation, micro irrigation, and of course, nutrient and pest management, all for urban farms. Next slide, please. So I just want to give you all a little tidbit about our wildlife strategy that we've been developing. Um, it's a five-year plan. So we first went to the state technical committee back in June asking for recommendations on spe species that uh, they thought NRCS should target our, our funding and resources. So we took that suite of species. We've been in talks with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And through all of this discussion, we have identified targeted species that we'll be phasing in over the next five years um, to focus our ranking and funding opportunities. And importantly, this is going to be implemented across our programs. So cost share programs, um, our easement programs, and also our partnership programs. So in years one through five, um, we will be um, targeting northern bobwhite quail and Florida panther. We've already done work on these species so we can kind of hit the ground running. We will be working closely with our staff and with partners to identify conservation practices and management needs for some of these other species I've identified here. The reticulated flatwood salamander and frosted flatwood salamander. We'll also be looking at the Florida grasshopper sparrow. And then you'll see mussels, various crayfish, blue nose shiner, and the southern tessellated darter are the other species we'll be focusing on. Um, and so we're going to be really looking at conservation practices that identify, you know, whether um, they treat soil erosion or nutrient management to be able to help benefit these species. So more to come on that, but just want to give you all an update that is um, definitely been developed and in the works. Next slide, please. And I believe this is my final slide. So one of our, our big programs is the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. This is where partners come to the table and provide a proposal for a specific area in the state that they would like to implement a project. They identify that scope of the project, the other partners I um, included, and also the resource concerns that they want to see identified and, and addressed um, in that project area. So we've got an, a funding opportunity coming up either at the end of this year or early next year. Um, it's in the midst of the final review up in the national office. And I wanted just to let you all know that if you're interested in learning more about this program um, or have an idea for a project that you would like to bring to NRCS, you know, this is really the time to plan. So um, feel free to get in touch with me and I can set up a meeting with our state conservationist Juan Hernandez to kind of go over the program in details and your ideas. Next slide, please.
And that is it, it for my presentation. Happy to entertain questions. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thanks, Nina. Uh, appreciate it. Um, we are going to shift into a kind of a second question and answer period. I did, uh, again, wanted to hit on uh, just a couple of things prior to that as it relates to the, the, the presentations. Um, again, the, the role of OAWP uh, in, in conjunction with our agency partners with DEP, with, with the water management districts within RCS, um, you know, with our, our stakeholders, I think is, is extremely important to us, um, especially for me coming from a, a policy background, coming from a couple of the water management districts. Um, you know, as such, you heard St. John's uh, and, and Hugh from, from Swanee hit on uh, the, the very important minimum flow and levels conversations ongoing. Um, the Central Florida Water Initiative process was, uh, was painful for many of us. Uh, but it, it was one of those collaborative efforts where we, we do have a water scarcity issue. We've got a demand issue. Um, we have a, a rapidly developing area, um, and it was important um, to, to stakeholders. So, uh, you know, OAWP uh, took uh, great pleasure in, in working with the water management districts, but also uh, in making sure that, that uh, you know, we had the, the coordination with the impacted stakeholders. Um, you know, we, we did uh, through the policy and planning group run the, the coordinating uh, group for, for agriculture and we teamed with, with other impacted stakeholders to, to try and make sure that we came out to a result that uh, hopefully is, is going to be palatable and at least provide us a path forward, um, you know, into the, the future. Likewise, in the Swanee region, um, you know, we are making sure that uh, we are coordinating uh, with the stakeholders there. Uh, to be able to, to continue to engage uh, as those minimum flows and levels um, are uh, developed, um, you know, related to that. And, and Hugh and Libby and, and the staff of the, the Water Management District have been great to work with. Um, but taking our uh, irrigation demand projections that come out from FSED, you saw the numbers. Um, you know, we, we continue to look at how to become more efficient in terms of uh, irrigation and, and partner with our district partners on that, but uh, you know there are changes in land use. There's changes in production that that occur, uh, and having those policy conversations continue to be to be very very important. Um, I will highlight, and and Libby was on, and Suzanne Archer from St. John's, and, and Dave from Northwest, and uh, when when Brett doesn't want to yell at me, uh, you know it, it, it the ag teams mark. Um, you know, you, you've heard on his experience, and he's going to be a, a, a great loss. Libby um, from from Swanee, um, you know, the, the the importance of the ag teams at the districts and, and the ability to interact with with the policy staff and, and the uh, the field staff is just invaluable. Another area that we didn't hit on uh, real hard, but is is very very important. You know, is our statutory obligation. Uh, to, to kind of be quasi-judicial as it relates to permitting uh, and as it relates to uh, the agricultural exemptions that have been written into 373-406, um, where uh, the ability to interact with the, the district staff and understand what's going on. Uh, you heard the, the reference uh, to the, the increased ERPs that are being, being seen. Um, there's some great things going on in terms of uh, both cost share and independent projects uh, that are, are conservation related and the, you know, the, the exemptions that exist there. Um, you know, that, that binding determination piece and, and uh, you know, the, the collaboration that exists at the, the ag team level uh, between OAWP and the, the water management districts is, is extremely important. Um, Julie hit on uh, a lot of the things that they're doing. Uh, I know policy staff and Jasenia does a great job. Um, we continue to coordinate to make sure uh, data management-wise, how are we, you know, coordinating uh, in in making sure that we're collecting the data and managing in a way that we're going to be able to to interact interact as as B maps are updated, um, as you know, we're doing the NARF data for the first time. Um, information obtained uh, is is something that has to be interpreted, and and uh, how that how that plays into the B map assessment process is something that we continue to to work with Julie's team. Uh, to, to make sure that we're going to get to uh, a result that, that treats the data adequately, maintains the, the roles that are clearly defined in statute between the state agencies and, and gets us to 
uh, the point that obviously it's in statute for a reason. We need to, to continue the, the, the progress towards, uh, you know, making sure that, that we continue to move forward as a, uh, uh, as a state. Um, I mentioned the, refer the, the leveraging of the cost share, um, you know, the, the, the roles of the various agencies in making sure that um, we work together, uh, the TCAA uh, area, Tri-County Agricultural Area in, in St. John's is a great example where you have St. John's Water Management District, DEP, uh, and, and OIWP coming together and, and figuring out, um, okay, what, what can we do? Uh, who can fund what? You know, what is most appropriate under the, the Water Conservation Water Resource Authority of the Water Management Districts? What is more appropriate under um, you know, some of the, the BEP frameworks, what's more appropriate under the, the, the time frames and the, the, the cost share programs that, that operate uh, with the, the Office of Ag Water Policy and our conservation uh, district uh, partners. That, that continued um, cooperation is just exceedingly important in that, um, you know, these games do, uh, are expected to be maintained. Uh, they are efficiency tied. Uh, they are tied into, in, in many cases, if not all cases, the, the, the BMAPs and the ability to meet the BMAPs, which means that uh, it, it's something that those efficiency gains are, are meant to be, um, if not perpetual, maintained over, over a time period because they are uh, articulated and, and reduction credits are, are provided under uh, the, the BMAP framework. So we have worked very, very hard, and we appreciate the cooperation of the districts in um, sharing the cost share data so we, we, so we understand um, you know, where the projects are occurring. Um, we do work with producers that are enrolled uh, so that we know when we're out on our IV visits to be able to talk about what's going on on the production landscape and um, make sure that there's a, again, there's an understanding given those touches on the, uh, the individual producer level uh, to, to make sure that those efficiencies um, continue to be viable and we continue to figure out how to best use those limited taxpayer resources. So um, we just uh, really appreciate the opportunity. We appreciate the partnership that we have uh, with the Water Management District and the continued conversations as to how to share uh, data, how to leverage uh, the limited state dollars and, and how to get to uh, the goals that uh, DEP continues to examine and, and reassess during the, uh, the, the BMAP process. So um, just all that is extremely important. And I uh, just wanted to, again, say say thank you um, as, as a cantankerous person at times. Um, it's, it's always a joy to work with the EDs and staff. Um, with that, uh, anybody who has questions, either for, uh, for my wonderful staff or the, the great folks uh, that are on from the Water Management Districts or, or Nina from NRCS or uh, Julie and her folks, please raise your hand. Um, happy to continue the conversation and uh, looking forward to it. All right. Well, thanks, Nina. And uh, as Chris said, we'll go ahead. Uh, the raise hand feature has been enabled again, and we're going to unmute everyone. So uh, if you have any question, please raise your hand and we will give a yell. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands so far. If you want to give everybody, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask one of my favorite people a question if I could. Um, okay. Libby uh, from South Florida, uh, if you don't mind, you were talking about the RFP. There have been a number of projects that have been submitted over that there was a previous RFP. Um, they've been submitted as part of the, you know, some of the stuff that's come out of the department as it relates to the BMAPs, and they've been on BMAP lists. Um, you know, just for folks that are on, is is this RFP looking? You know, I, I, obviously you're looking for, you know, as much in, in anything that you can get in terms of the the North of the Lake pieces. But um, for those projects that have been previously submitted and recognized as as valuable and whatnot, um, is, is the expectation that they resubmit under this RFP? Uh, yes, because we want to 
create like a, a current database. So we're even our um, our projects that are <clears throat> are current, we want them to resubmit um, because we want to have an up to date list. And you know, we look at um, like what, at um, Colonel Reynolds' presentation at the governing board in October in Okeechobee. You know, one of the things that she emphasized was um, we want you know we want obviously we want to keep the projects that are, are working well but maybe there's something different that that those people would like to do and so um we want to just look at all the projects with um fresh eyes and then you know kind of have an entire suite so that when we do get dep says look you know we've got money for a project at this basin you know what do you have we can pull that up and say, okay, this is a landowner that wants to work with us, here we go. And so I think they're looking for a, a current list of everything we have of everybody that still wants to participate and, and new people that want to participate. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, we still don't have any raised hands. So uh, Chris, if you had anything else, please. Uh, go I ahead. Was, I was going to sing uh, Mr. Cypress's praises and, and sing Hugh's praises a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that we didn't touch on as much, but it, it has come up lately at, um, you know, at Swanee River Water Management District meetings. Um, you know, we do have neighbors to the north and uh, there have been some some interesting uh, issues that have arisen, uh, be it, uh, you know, tied to the Apalachicola, uh, tied to the Wipacoochee. Um, you know, we, we do have transboundary uh, in, in this area of the world. I know that we, we look at, in many cases, um, the, you know, the in Florida type pieces, but uh, we do have issues that arise uh, related to our, our neighbors to the north and, and, and neighbors to the west. Um, and you know the the Swanee River Partnership, the the, the work that uh, you know the Brett and his folks have done. Um, you know we we've been able to engage the the federal government um, uh, on a couple of different issues, but also through some you know through some grants. Um, you know we we've had this wonderful collaboration. Uh, you know with Northwest as it relates to uh, Hurricane Michael restoration funds and just some wonderful things that we've been able to uh, to to achieve. Uh, have had some interesting conversations with uh, USDA um, about how to continue to to realize the efficiencies and and uh, work through the the federal process. Um, and at uh, USDA DC, uh, Nina Nina does some, does great work. Um, so just the 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 fact that we do have um, issues that that do cross boundaries that require again that that teamwork to get to the outcomes that. Um, you know, water doesn't recognize borders, uh, arbitrary uh, political uh, lines drawn in the sand, um, you know, be it the Florida aquifer, be it the, uh, the, the transboundary ri boundary rivers, um, you know, be it some of the challenges that we have, uh, the water management districts, DEP, you know, our program, we, we do engage on those. And I, I wanted to, to recognize that, um, you know, you, you mentioned the Swanee River Partnership, uh, it's been something that continues to be trumpeted that it that has allowed us to achieve some really really good things and again bob hockey moves on kelly all from um uf ifas uh helps us to to keep ourselves straight and drive that and uh, again there's there's opportunities for engagement um as things arise i think that that it's important that those lines of communication continue to be open uh and and we get everybody together to have those kind of those hard uh hard conversations about what we're seeing uh, be it within a basin or be it something that expands over the uh, over the boundaries. So um, I figured I'd tap dance for another couple of minutes just to see if there were any questions that arose, but I think uh, that's an important thing as well. I think Brett was going to comment. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, since we're getting sentimental here, um, I'll throw out a couple of thank yous myself. Thanks to uh, Swift Mud for creating the foundation for uh the cooperative projects between uh ourselves and and farmers and and hugh for, and and swanee for for taking that and creating a an excellent program over there and thank you chris for for being uh good partners at dax uh even um when we double our staff uh 
uh, off of your agency. So thank you, sir. We appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Anybody have anything further? We can we can very easily give you back 15 minutes uh, prior to your, uh, your your lunch time. We we appreciate everybody joining us. Um, again, if if you need us, uh, please see the the web page. Um, see uh, you know how to get in touch with us. I think my my cell phone's always on. Um, I know staff is is always willing to have conversation. Um, we are in the middle of legislative session, so. Uh, who knows where where things are going to go there? Uh, it's always a an interesting process because we do continue to move forward uh, as a state. Um, the agricultural community continues to be very dynamic, operate with a number of different uh, challenges that are uh, that are out there that are emerging. Um, over the past year, everybody has kind of seen some of the conversations that have been uh, had as it relates to certain commodities coming in from. Uh, international uh, areas that that undercut our producers. Um, you know, the the on the the citrus side, the citrus uh, projections just came out, and uh, there continues to be some struggles related to uh, to greening and and to production that that tie into any number of different programs, including OAWP. Um, it's just a very dynamic environment. And uh, last we checked, we still have a state that. Is predicated on a thousand people a day and 120 million people visiting uh, Orlando and the beaches and uh, continuing to frankly alter the eco hydrology of the state, which makes uh, both agricultural production more challenging as well as uh, water resource and natural resource management. So um, the conversations continue. Uh, we appreciate the ability to work with our, our partners, uh, both in terms of stakeholders on the ground and, and producers academic partners, um, uh, industry, uh, the water management districts, DEP, uh, other agencies. Uh, it, it's only in, in continuing these conversations that we're gonna be successful. And, and again, I've got some of the best staff on the, on the planet. Uh, the only success I have is due to them uh, and this office has is due to them. So uh, uh, please recognize them and, and uh, continue to work with them um, uh, to, to make great progress. And, with that, we appreciate everybody. If uh, if anybody needs to get in touch with us, please reach out, and uh, we will see you in person next year. Uh, probably a bit of an expanded program, uh, and the ability to have some some side discussions in three D. So thank you very much. All right, thanks everybody. <laughs>